of temptation, the nature and power of it, the danger of entering into it, and the means of preventing that danger, with a resolution of sundry cases thereunto belonging. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Revelations 3.10 The following discourse is by Dr. John Owen. Christian reader, if thou art in any measure awake in these days wherein we live, and hast taken notice of the manifold, great, and various temptations wherewith all sorts of persons that know the Lord, and profess his name, are beset, and whereunto they are continually exposed, with what success those temptations have obtained to the unspeakable scandal of the gospel, with the wounding and ruin of innumerable souls, I suppose I will not inquire any further after other reasons of the publishing of the ensuing warnings and directions, being suited to the times that pass over us, and thine own concernment in them. This I shall say only to those who think me to persist in any such inquiry, that though my first engagement for the exposing of these meditations to public view did arise from the desires of some, whose avouching the interest of Christ in the world by personal holiness and constant adhering to everything that is made precious by its relation to him, have given them power over me to require at any time services of greater importance, yet I dare not lay my doing of it so upon that account as in the least to intimate that, with respect to the general state of things mentioned, I did not myself esteem it seasonable and necessary. The variety of outward providences and dispensations wherewith I have myself been exercised in this world, with the inward trials that have been attended with, added to the observation that I have had advantages to make of the ways and walkings of others, their beginnings, progresses and endings, their risings and falls, in profession and conversation, in darkness and light, have left such a constant sense and impression of the power and danger of temptation upon my mind and spirit, that without other pleas and pretenses I cannot but own a serious call to men to beware, with the discovery of some of the most eminent ways and means of the prevalency of present temptations to have been, in my own judgment, in this season needful." But now, reader, if thou art amongst them who takes no notice of these things, or cares not for them, who hast no sense of the efficacy and dangers of temptation in thine own walking and profession, nor hast observed the power of them upon others, who discernest not the manifold advantages that they have got in these days, wherein all things are shaken, nor has been troubled or moved for the sad successes they have had amongst professors, but supposest that all things are well within doors and without, and would be better couldst thou obtain fuller satisfaction to some of thy lusts in the pleasures or profits of the world, I desire thee to know that I write not for thee, nor do esteem thee a fit reader or judge of what is here written." Whilst all the issues of providential dispensations in reference to the public concernments of these nations are perplexed and entangled, the footsteps of God lying in the deep, where his paths are not known, whilst in particular unparalleled distresses and strange prosperities are measured out to men, yea, to professors, whilst a spirit of error, giddiness, and delusion goes forth with such strength and efficacy as it seems to have received a commission to go and prosper, whilst there are such divisions, strife, emulations, attended with such evil surmises, wrath and revenge found amongst brethren, whilst the desperate issues and products of men's temptations are seen daily in partial and total apostasy in the decay of love, the overthrow of faith, our days being filled with fearful examples of backsliding, such as former ages never knew, 
Whilst there is a visible declension from reformation season upon the professing party of these nations, both as to personal holiness and zeal for the interest of Christ, he that understands not that there is an hour of temptation come upon the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth, is doubtless either himself at present captivated under the power of some woeful lust, corruption, or temptation, or is indeed stark blind and knows not at all what it is to serve God in temptations. With such, then, I have not at present to do. For those who have in general a sense of these things, who also in some measure are able to consider that the plague is begun, that they may be further awakened to look about them, lest the infection have approached nearer to them by some secret and imperceptible ways than they did apprehend, or, or lest they should be surprised at unawares hereafter by any of those temptations that in these days either waste at noon or else walk in darkness is the ensuing warning intended. And for the sake of them that mourn in secret for all the abominations that are found among and upon them that profess the gospel, and who are under the conduct of the captain of their salvation, fighting and resisting the power of temptations, from what spring soever they rise in themselves, are the ensuing directions proposed to consideration that our faithful and merciful high priest, who both suffered and was tempted, and is on that account touched with the feeling of our infirmities, would accompany this small discourse with seasonable supplies of his spirit, and suitable mercy to them that shall consider it, that it may be useful to his servants for the ends whereunto it is designed, is a prayer of him who received this handful of seed from his storehouse and treasure. John Owen of Temptation, The Nature and Power of It Chapter 1 Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Matthew twenty six forty one. These words of our Savior are repeated with very little alteration in three evangelists. Only whereas Matthew and Mark have recorded them as above written, Luke reports them thus. Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation, so that the whole of his caution seems to have been, Arise, watch and pray, that ye enter not into temptation. Solomon tells us of some that lie down on the top of a mast in the midst of the sea, Proverbs 23:34, men overborne by security in the mouth of destruction. If ever poor souls lay down on the top of a mast in the midst of the sea, these disciples with our Savior in the garden did so. Their master, at a little distance from them, was offering up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, Hebrews 5, 7, being then taken into his hand, and beginning to taste that cup that was filled with the curse and wrath due to their sins. The Jews, armed for his and their destruction, being but a little more distant from them, on the other hand, our Saviour had a little before informed them that that night he should be betrayed and be delivered up to be slain. They saw that he was sorrowful and very heavy. Matthew twenty six thirty seven. Nay, he told them plainly that his soul was exceeding sorrowful even unto death, verse 38, and therefore entreated them to tarry and watch with him. Now he was dying, and that for them. In this condition, leaving them but a little space, like men forsaken of all love towards him or care of themselves, they fall fast asleep. Even the best of saints, being left to themselves, will quickly appear to be less than men, to be nothing. All our own strength is weakness, and all our wisdom folly. Peter being one of them, who but a little before had with so much self-confidence affirmed that though all men forsook him, yet he would never do so, our Savior expostulates the matter in particular with him. Verse 40, he saith to Peter, Could you not watch with me one hour? As if he should have said, 
Art thou he, Peter, who but now boasts of thy resolution never to forsake me? Is it likely that thou shouldst hold out therein when thou canst not wash with me one hour? Is this thy dying for me, to be dead in security when I am dying for thee? And indeed it would be an amazing thing to consider that Peter should make so high a promise and be immediately so careless and remiss in the pursuit of it, but that we find the root of the same treachery abiding and working in our own hearts, and do see the fruit of it brought forth every day, the most noble engagements to obedience quickly ending in deplorable negligence, Romans 7.18. In this estate, our Savior admonishes them of their condition, their weakness, their danger, and stirs them up to a prevention of that ruin which lay at the door. He says, Arise, watch, and pray. I shall not insist on the particular aimed at here by our Savior in this caution to them that were then present with him. The great temptation that was coming on them from the scandal of the cross was doubtless in his eye. But I shall consider the words as containing a general direction to all the disciples of Christ and their following of him throughout all generations. There are three things in the words. 1. The evil cautioned against temptation. 2. The means of its prevalency by our entering into it. Number three, the way of preventing it. Watch and pray. It is not in my thoughts to handle the commonplace of temptations, but only the danger of them in general, with the means of preventing that danger. Yet that we may know what we affirm, and whereof we speak, some concernments of the general nature of temptation may be premised. First, for the general nature of tempting and temptation, it lies amongst things indifferent to try, to experiment, to prove, to pierce a vessel, that the liquor that is in it may be known, is as much as is signified by it. Hence God is said sometimes to tempt, and we are commanded as our duty to tempt, or try, or search ourselves to know what is in us, and to pray that God would do so also. So temptation is like a knife that may either cut the meat or the throat of a man. It may be his food or his poison, his exercise or his destruction. Secondly, Temptation in its special nature, as it denotes any evil, is considered either actively as it leads to evil, or passively as it has an evil and suffering in it. So temptation is taken for affliction, James 1, 2, for in that sense we are to count it all joy when we fall into temptation, in the other, that we enter not into it. Again, actively considered, it either denotes in the tempter a design for the bringing about of the special end of temptation, namely a leading into evil. So it is said that God tempts no man, James 1.13, with a design for sin as such, or the general nature and end of temptation, which is trial. So God tempted Abraham, Genesis 22, 1, and he proves or tempts by false prophets, Deuteronomy 13, 3. Now, as to God's tempting of any, two things are to be considered. One, the end why he does it. Two, the way whereby he does it. For the first, his general ends are two. He does it to show to man what is in him, that is, the man himself and that either as to his grace or to his corruption. I speak not now of it, as it may have a place and bear a part in judiciary obduration. Grace and corruption lie deep in the heart. Men oftentimes deceive themselves in the search after the one or the other of them. When we give vent to the soul to try what grace is there, corruption comes out. And when we search for corruption, grace appears. So is a soul kept in uncertainty. We fail in our trials. God comes with a gauge that goes to the bottom. He sends his instruments of trial into the bowels and the inmost parts of the soul, and lets man see what is in him, 
of what metal he is constituted. Thus he tempted Abraham to show him his faith. Abraham knew not what faith he had, I mean what power and vigor was in his faith, until God drew it out by that great trial and temptation. When God says he knew it, he made Abraham know it. So he tried Hezekiah to discover his pride. God left him that he might see what was in his heart, Second Chronicles 32.31. He knew not that he had such a proud heart, so apt to be lifted up, as he appeared to have until God tried him, and so let out his filth and poured it out before his face. The issues of such discoveries to the saints in thankfulness, humiliation, and treasuring up of experiences I shall not treat of. 2. God does it to show himself to man, and that, first, in a way of preventing grace, a man shall see that it is God alone who keeps from all sin. Until we are tempted, we think we live on our own strength. Though all men do this or that, we will not. When the trial comes, we quickly see whence is our preservation by standing or falling. So was it in the case of Abimelech. Genesis 20, verse 6, I withheld thee. Number 2, in a way of renewing grace, he would have the temptation continue with Paul that he might reveal himself to him in the sufficiency of his renewing grace, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. We know not the power and strength that God puts forth in our behalf, nor what is the sufficiency of his grace until, comparing the temptation with our own weakness, it appears to us. The efficacy of an antidote is found when poison has been taken, and the preciousness of medicines is made known by diseases. We shall never know what strength there is in grace if we know not what strength there is in temptation. We must be tried, that we may be made sensible of being preserved. In many other good and gracious ends he hath, which he accomplisheth towards his saints by his trials and temptations, not now to be insisted on. For the ways whereby God accomplisheth this his search, trial, or temptation, these are some of them. He puts men on great duties, such as they cannot apprehend that they have any strength for, nor indeed have. So he tempted Abraham by calling him to that duty of sacrificing his son, a thing absurd to reason, bitter to nature, and grievous to him on all accounts whatever. Many men know not what is in them, or rather what is ready for them, until they are put upon what seems utterly above their strength, indeed upon what is really above their strength. The duties that God in an ordinary way requires at our hands are not proportioned to what strength we have in ourselves, but to what help and relief is laid up for us in Christ and we are to address ourselves to the greatest performances with a settled persuasion that we have not ability for the least. This is the law of grace. But yet, when any duty is required that is extraordinary, that is a secret not often discovered. In the yoke of Christ it is a trial, a temptation. Also, by putting them upon great sufferings, how many have unexpectedly found strength to die at a stake, to endure tortures for Christ, yet their call to it was a trial. This, Peter tells us, is one way whereby we are brought into trying temptations, 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. Our temptations arise from the fiery trial, and yet the end is but a trial of our faith. Number three, by his providential disposing of things so as that occasions to sin will be administered to men, which is a case mentioned, Deuteronomy 13.3, and innumerable other instances may be adjoined. Now they are not properly the temptations of God as coming from him, with his end upon them that are here intended, and therefore I shall set these apart for our present consideration. It is, then, temptation in its special nature, as it denotes an active efficiency towards sinning, as it is mentioned with evil to evil that I intend. 
In this sense, temptation may proceed either singly from Satan, or the world, or other men in the world, or from ourselves, or jointly from all or some of them in their several combinations. Number 1. Satan tempts sometimes singly by himself without taking advantage from the world, the things or persons of it, or ourselves. So he deals in his injection of evil and blasphemous thoughts of God into the hearts of the saints, which is his own work alone, without any advantage from the world or our own hearts. For nature will contribute nothing thereunto, nor anything that is in the world, nor any man out of the world. For none can conceive a God and conceive evil of him. Herein Satan is alone in the sin, and shall be so in the punishment. These fiery darts are prepared in the forge of his own malice, and shall with all their venom and poison be turned into his own heart forever. Number 2. Sometimes he makes use of the world and joins forces against us without any helps from within. So he tempted our Savior by showing him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And the variety of the assistances he finds from the world in persons and things which I must not insist on, the innumerable instruments and weapons he takes from thence of all sorts and at all seasons, are inexpressible. Number 3. Sometimes he takes in assistance from ourselves also. It is not with us as it was with Christ when Satan came to tempt him. He declares that he had nothing in him, John 14.30. It is otherwise with us. He has, for the compassing of most of his ends, a sure party within our own breasts. James 1.14 and 15. Thus he tempted Judas. He was at work himself. He put it into his heart to betray Christ. Luke 22.3 He entered into him for that purpose. And he sets the world at work, the things of it, providing for him thirty pieces of silver. Verse 5 They covenanted to give him money. And the men of it, even the priests and the Pharisees, and calleth in the assistance of his own corruption, he was covetous, a thief and had the bag. I might also show how the world and our own corruptions do act singly by themselves and jointly in conjunction with Satan and one another in this business of temptation. But the truth is, the principles, ways, and means of temptations, the kinds, degrees, efficacy, and causes of them, are so inexpressibly large and various the circumstances of them from providence, natures, conditions, spiritual and natural, with the particular cases thence arising, so innumerable and impossible to be comprised within any bound or order, that to attempt the giving an account of them would be to undertake that which would be endless. I shall content myself to give a description of the general nature of that which we are to watch against which will make way for what I aim at. Temptation, then, in general, is anything, state, way, or condition, that upon any account whatever has a force or efficacy to seduce, to draw the mind and heart of a man from its obedience, which God requires of him, into any sin in any degree of it whatever. In particular, that is a temptation to any man which causes or occasions him to sin, or in anything to go off from his duty, either by bringing evil into his heart, or drawing out that evil that is in his heart, or any other way diverting him from communion with God, and that constant, equal, universal obedience and matter and manner that is required of him. For the clearing of this description, I shall only observe that though temptation seems to be of a more active importance, and so to denote only the power of seduction to sin itself, yet in the scripture it is commonly taken in a neuter sense, and denotes a matter of the temptations or the thing whereby we are tempted, and this is the ground of the description I have given of it, be it what it will, that from anything whatever within us or without us has advantage to hinder in duty or to provoke to or in any way to occasion sin, that is a temptation and so to be looked on. 
be it business, employment, course of life, company, affections, nature, or corrupt design, relations, delights, name, reputation, esteem, abilities, parts or excellencies of body or mind, place, dignity, art, so far as they further or occasion the promotion of the ends before mentioned, they are all of them no less truly temptations than the most violent solicitations of Satan or allurements of the world, and that soul lies at the brink of ruin who discerns it not. And this will be further discovered in our process. Chapter 2. What it is to enter into temptation. Section 2. Having showed what temptation is, I come secondly to manifest what it is to enter into temptation. Number 1. This is not merely to be tempted. It is impossible that we should be so free from temptation as not to be at all tempted. Whilst Satan continues in his power and malice, whilst the world and lust are in being, we shall be tempted. Christ, says one, was made like unto us that he might be tempted, and we are tempted that we may be made like unto Christ. Temptation in general is comprehensive of our whole warfare, as our Savior calls the time of his ministry the time of his temptations, Luke 22:28. We have no promise that we shall not be tempted at all, nor are to pray for an absolute freedom from temptations, because we have no such promise of being heard therein. The direction we have for our prayers is, Lead us not into temptation. Matthew 6.13 It is entering into temptation that we are to pray against. We may be tempted, yet not enter into temptation. So that, number two, something more is intended by this expression than the ordinary work of Satan and our own lusts, which will be sure to tempt us every day. There is something signal in this entering into temptation that is not the saint's every day's work. It is something that befalls them peculiarly in reference to seduction unto sin, on one account or other, by the way of allurement or affrightment. Number three, it is not to be conquered by a temptation, to fall down under it, to commit the sin or evil that we are tempted to, or to omit the duties that are opposed. A man may enter into temptation and yet not fall under temptation. God can make a way for a man to escape. When he is in, he can break the snare, tread down Satan, and make the soul more than a conqueror, though it have entered into temptation. Christ entered into it, but was not in the least foiled by it. But, but number four, it is as the apostle expresseth it, 1 Timothy 6, 9, to fall into temptation, as a man falls into a pit or deep place, where are gins or snares, wherewith he is entangled. The man is not presently killed and destroyed, but he is entangled and detained. He knows not how to get free or be at liberty. So it is expressed again to the same purpose, 1 Corinthians 10.13. No temptation hath taken you. That is, to be taken by a temptation and to be entangled with it, held in its cords, not finding at present a way to escape. Thence saith Peter, 2nd Epistle 2.9, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. They are entangled with them. God knows how to deliver them out of them. When we suffer a temptation to enter into us, then we enter into temptation. Whilst it knocks at the door, we are at liberty. But when any temptation comes in and parleys with the heart, reasons with the mind, entices and allures the affections, be it a long or a short time, do it thus insensibly and imperceptibly, or do the soul take notice of it, we enter into temptation. So then, unto our entering into temptation is required first that by some advantage or on some occasion Satan be more earnest than ordinary in his solicitations to sin, by affrightments or allurements, by persecutions or seductions, 
by himself or others, or that some lust or corruption by his instigation and advantages of outward objects, provoking as in prosperity, or terrifying as in trouble, do tumultuate more than ordinary within us. There is a special acting of the author and principles of temptation required thereunto. Number two, that the heart be so far entangled with it as to be put to dispute and argue in its own defense, and yet not be wholly able to eject or cast out the poison and leaven that has been injected, but is surprised, if it be never so little off its watch into an entanglement not easy to be avoided, so that the soul may cry and pray and cry again, and yet not be delivered. Is Paul besought the Lord thrice for the departure of his temptation, and prevailed not? The entanglement continues, and this usually falls out in one of these two seasons. 1. When Satan, by the permission of God, for ends best known to himself, hath got some peculiar advantage against the soul, as in the case of Peter, he sought to winnow him, and prevailed. Or when a man's lusts and corruptions meet with peculiarly provoking objects and occasions through the condition of life that a man is in, with the circumstances of it, as it was with David, of both which afterward. In this state of things, a man is entered into temptation, and this is called the hour of temptation, Revelations 3.10, the season wherein it grows to a head, the discovery whereof will give further light into the present inquiry about what it is to enter into temptation, for when the hour of temptation has come upon us, we are entered into it. Every great and pressing temptation hath its hour, a season wherein it grows to a head, wherein it is most vigorous, active, operative, and prevalent. It may be long in rising, it may be long urging, more or less, but it hath a season wherein, from the conjunction of other occurrences, such as those mentioned, outward or inward, it hath a dangerous hour. And then, for the most part, men enter into it. Hence that very temptation which at one time hath little or no power on a man, he can despise it, scorn the motions of it, easily resist it. At another, there is him away quite before it. It hath, from other circumstances and occurrences, got new strength and efficacy, or the man is innervated and weakened, the hour is come, he has entered into it, and it prevails. David probably had temptations before in his younger days to adultery or murder, as he had in the case of Nabal, but the hour of temptation was not come, it had not got its advantages about it, and so he escaped until afterward. Let men look for it that are exposed to temptations, and who is not. They will have a season wherein their solicitations will be more urgent, their reasonings more plausible, pretenses more glorious, hopes of recovery more appearing, opportunities more broad and open, the doors of evil made more beautiful than ever they have been. Blessed is he who is prepared for such a season, without which there is no escaping. This is, as I said, the first thing required to entering into temptation. If we stay here, we are safe. Before I descend to other particulars, having now entered hereon, I shall show in general first, how or by what means commonly any temptation attains a sour. Secondly, how we may know when any temptation has come to its high noon, and is in its hour. First, it doth the first by several ways. By long solicitations, causing the mind frequently to converse with the evil solicited too, it begets extenuating thoughts of it. If it makes this process, it is coming towards its hour. It may be when first it began to press upon the soul, the soul was amazed with the ugly appearance of what it aimed at, and cried, Am I a dog? 
If this indigation be not daily heightened, but the soul by conversing with the evil begins to grow as it were familiar with it, not to be startled as formerly, but rather inclines to cry, Is it not a little one? Then the temptation is coming towards its high noon. Lust hath and enticed and entangled and is ready to conceive, James 1.15, of which more at large afterward. In our inquiry, how we may know whether we are entered into temptation or no, our present inquest is after the hour and power of temptation itself. Secondly, when it hath prevailed on others, and the soul is not filled with dislike and abhorrency of them in their ways, nor with pity and prayer for their deliverance, this proves an advantage to it, and raises it towards its height. When that temptation sets upon any one which at the same time has possessed and prevailed with many, it hath so great and so many advantages thereby that it is surely growing towards its hour. Its prevailing with others is a means to give it its hour against us. The falling off of Hymenaeus and Philetus is said to overthrow the faith of some, Second Timothy 2, 17 and 18. Thirdly, by complicating itself with many considerations that perhaps are not absolutely evil, so did the temptation of the Galatians to fall from the purity of the gospel, freedom from persecution, union and consent with the Jews. Things in themselves good were pleaded in it, and gave life to the temptation itself. But I shall not now insist on the several advantages that any temptation hath to heighten and greaten itself, to make itself prevalent and effectual, with the contribution that it receives to this purpose from various circumstances, opportunities, specious pleas and pretenses, necessities for the doing that which cannot be done without answering the temptation, and the like, because I must speak unto some of them afterward. Secondly, for the second it may be known, first, by its restless urgency in arguing, when a temptation is in its hour, it is restless. It is a time of battle, and it gives the soul no rest. Satan sees his advantage, considers his conjunction of forces, and knows that he must now prevail or be hopeless forever. Here are opportunities, here are advantages, here are specious pleas and pretenses. Some ground is already got by former arguings. Here, here are extenuations of the evil, hopes of pardon by after endeavors, all in a readiness. If he can do nothing now, he must sit down lost in his undertakings. So when he had got all things in a readiness against Christ, he made it the hour of darkness. When a temptation presses within doors by imaginations and reasonings, without by solicitations, advantages, and opportunities, let the soul know that the hour of it is come, and the glory of God with its own welfare depends on its behavior in this trial, as we shall see in the particular cases following. When it makes a conjunction of affrightments and allurements, these two comprise the whole forces of temptation. When both are brought together, temptation is in its hour. They were both, in David's cases, in the murder of Uriah. There was a fear of his revenge on his wife, and possibly on himself, in fear of the publication of his sin at least. And there was the allurement of his present enjoyment of her, whom he lusted after. Men sometimes are carried into sin by love to it, and are continued in it by fear of what will ensue upon it. But in any case where these two meet, something allures us, something affrights us, and the reasonings that run between them are ready to entangle us, then is the hour of temptation. This, then, is to enter into temptation. This is the hour of it, of which more in the process of our discourse. Section 3. There is a means of prevention prescribed by our Savior. There, too, number one, watch. Number two, pray. The first is a general expression by no means to be limited to its native signification of waking from sleep. 
to which is as much as to be on our guard, to take heed, to consider all ways and means whereby an enemy may approach to us. So the Apostle, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, that is, to watch in this business, to stand fast in the faith, as good soldiers, to quit ourselves like men, it is as much as to take heed, or look to ourselves as the same thing is by our Savior often expressed, so Revelation 3, 2, a universal carefulness and diligence exercising itself in and by all ways and means prescribed by God over our hearts and ways, the baits and methods of Satan, the occasions and advantages of sin in the world, that we be not entangled, is that which in this word is pressed on us. Number 2. For the second direction of prayer, I need not speak to it. The duty and its concernments are known to all. I shall only add that these two comprise the whole endeavor of faith for the soul's preservation from temptation. Chapter 3 Having thus opened the words in the foregoing chapter, so far as is necessary to discover the foundation of the truth to be insisted on and improved, I shall lay it down in the ensuing observation. It is the great duty of all believers to use all diligence in the ways of Christ's appointment that they fall not into temptation. I know God is able to deliver the godly out of temptations. I know he is faithful not to suffer us to be tempted above what we are able, but will make a way for our escape. Yet I dare say I shall convince all those who will attend to what is delivered and written that it is our great duty and concernment to use all diligence, watchfulness, and care that we enter not into temptation. And I shall evince it by the ensuing considerations first in that compendious instruction given us by our Savior concerning what we ought to pray for. This of not entering into temptation is expressly one head. Our Savior knew of what concernment it was to us not to enter into temptation when he gave us this as one special subject of our daily dealing with God. Matthew 6.13 and the order of the word shows us of what importance it is. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. If we are led into temptation, evil will befall us, more or less. How God may be said to tempt us, or to lead us into temptation, I showed before. In this direction, it is not so much the not giving us up to it, as a powerful keeping us from it that is intended. The last words are, as it were, exegetical, or expository of the former. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So deal with us, that we may be powerfully delivered from that evil which attends our entering into temptation. Our blessed Savior knows full well our state and condition. He knows the power of temptations, having had experience of it. Hebrews 2.18 He knows our vain confidence and the reserves we have concerning our ability to deal with temptations, as he found it in Peter. But he knows our weakness and folly, and how soon we are cast to the ground, and therefore doth he lay in this provision for instruction at the entrance of his ministry, to make us heedful if possible, in that which is of so great concernment to us. If, then, we will repose any confidence in the wisdom, love, and care of Jesus Christ towards us, we must grant the truth pleaded for. Number 2. Christ promises this freedom and deliverance as a great reward of most acceptable obedience, Revelations 3.10. This is a great promise made to the church of Philadelphia, wherein Christ found nothing that he would blame. Thou shalt be kept from the hour of temptation. Not thou shalt be preserved in it, but he goes higher. Thou shalt be kept from it. There is, saith our Savior, an hour of temptation coming, a season that will make havoc in the world. Multitudes shall then fall from the faith, deny and blaspheme me. Oh, how few will be able to stand and hold out. Some will be utterly destroyed and perish forever. Some will get wounds to their souls that shall never be well healed whilst they live in this world and have their bones broken so as to go halting all their days. 
But, saith he, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will be tender towards thee, and keep thee from this hour of temptation. Certainly that which Christ thus promises to his beloved church, as a reward of her service, love, and obedience, is no light thing. Whatever Christ promiseth to his spouse is a fruit of unspeakable love. That is so in an especial manner which is promised as a reward of special obedience. Number three, let us to this purpose consider the general issue of men's entering into temptation and that of bad and good men, of ungrounded professors and of the choicest saints. For the first, I shall offer but one or two texts of Scripture, Luke 8.13. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and have no root but for a while believe. Well, how long do they believe? They are affected with the preaching of the word, and believe thereon. Make profession, bring forth some fruits. But until when do they abide, says he, in the time of temptation they fall away. When once they enter into temptation, they are gone forever. Temptation withers all their profession and slays their souls. We see this accomplished every day. Men who have attended on the preaching of the gospel, been affected and delighted with it, that have made profession of it, and have been looked on, it may be, as believers, and thus have continued for some years. No sooner doth temptation befall them that hath vigor and permanency in it, but they are turned out of the way and are gone forever. They fall to hate the word they have delighted in, despise the professors of it, and are hardened in sin. So Matthew 7.26 He that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not is like unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. But what does this house of profession do? It shelters him, keeps him warm, and stands for a while. But, saith he, verse 27, when the rain descends, when the temptation comes, it falls utterly, and its fall is great. Judas follows our Savior three years, and all goes well with him. He no sooner enters into temptation. Satan hath got him and winnowed him, but he is gone. Demas will preach the gospel until the love of the world befall him, and he is utterly turned aside. It were endless to give instances of this. Entrance into temptation is, with this sort of man, an entrance into apostasy, more or less. In part or in whole, it faileth not. 2. For the saints of God themselves, let us see by some instances what issue they have had of their entering into temptation. I shall name a few. Adam was the son of God, Luke 3.38, created in the image of God, full of that integrity, righteousness, and holiness, which might be and was an imminent resemblance of the holiness of God. He had a far greater inherent stock of ability than we, and had nothing in him to entice or seduce him. Yet this Adam no sooner enters into temptation, but he is gone, lost, and ruined, he and all his posterity with him. What can we expect in the like condition that have not only in our temptations as he had a cunning devil to deal with, but a cursed world and a corrupt heart also? Abraham was a father of the faithful, whose faith is proposed as a pattern to all them that shall believe, yet he, entering twice into the same temptation, namely that of fear about his wife, was twice overpowered by it to the dishonor of God, and no doubt the disquietment of his own soul, Genesis 12, 12 and 13, Genesis 20, verse 2. David is called a man after God's own heart, by God himself. Yet what a dreadful thing is the story of his entering into temptation. He is no sooner entangled, but he is plunged into adultery, thence seeking deliverance by his own invention, like a poor creature in a toil. He is entangled more and more until he lies as one dead, under the power of sin and folly. I might mention Noah, Lot, Hezekiah, Peter, and the rest.
whose temptations and falls therein are on record for our instruction. Certainly he that hath any heart in these things cannot but say as the inhabitants of Samaria upon the letter of Jehu, Behold, two kings stood not before him. How shall we stand? O Lord, if such mighty pillars have been cast to the ground, such cedars blown down, how shall I stand before temptations? O keep me that I enter not in. Behold the footsteps of them that have gone in. Whom do you see retiring without a wound, a blemish at least? On this account would the apostle have us to exercise tenderness towards them that are fallen into sin. Galatians 6, one, Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. He does not say, lest thou also sin, or fall, or be overtaken with a fault, but lest thou also be tempted. Thou seest the power of temptation in others, and knowest not how soon thou mayest be tempted, nor what will be the state and condition of thy soul thereupon. Assuredly, he that hath seen so many better, stronger men than himself fail and cast down in the trial, will think it incumbent on him to remember the battle, and if it be possible, to come there no more. Is it not a madness for a man that can scarce crawl up and down? He is so weak, which is the case of most of us. If he avoid not what he has seen giants foiled in and undertaking of, thou art yet whole and sound. Take heed of temptation, lest it be with thee as it was with Abraham, David, Lot, Peter, Hezekiah, the Galatians, who fell in the time of trial. In nothing doth the folly of the hearts of men show itself more openly in the days wherein we live than in this cursed boldness. After so many warnings from God and so many sad experiences every day under their eyes of running into and putting themselves upon temptations, any society, any company, any conditions of outward advantages without once weighing what their strength or what the concernment of their poor souls is, they are ready for, though they go over the dead and the slain that in those ways and paths, but even now fell down before them, yet they will go on without regard or trembling. At this door are gone out hundreds, thousands of professors within a few years. But, number four, let us consider ourselves, what our weakness is and what temptation is, its power and efficacy, with what it leads to. For ourselves, we are weakness itself. We have no strength, no power to withstand. Confidence of any strength in us is one great part of our weakness. It was so in Peter. He that says he can do anything can do nothing as he should. And which is worse, it is a worse kind of weakness that is in us. A weakness from treachery. A weakness arising from that party which every temptation hath in us. If a castle or fort be never so strong and well fortified, yet if there be a treacherous party within that is ready to betray it on every opportunity, there is no preserving it from the enemy. There are traitors in our hearts ready to take part, to close and side with every temptation, and to give up all to them, yea, to solicit and bribe temptations to do the work, as traitors incite an enemy. Do not flatter yourselves that you shall hold out. There are secret lusts that lie lurking in your hearts, which perhaps now stir not, which as soon as any temptation befalls you, will rise, tumultuate, cry, disquiet, seduce, and never give over until they are either killed or satisfied. He that promises himself that the frame of his heart will be the same under a temptation as it is before, will be woefully mistaken. Am I a dog that I should do this thing? says Haziel. Yea, thou wilt be such a dog if ever thou be king of Syria. Temptation from thy interest will unman thee. He that now abhors the thoughts of such and such a thing, if he once enters into temptation, will find his heart inflamed towards it, and all contrary reasonings overborne and silenced. He will deride his former fears, cast out his scruples, and contemn the consideration that he lived upon. Little did Peter think he should deny and forswear his master so soon as ever he was questioned whether he knew him or no. 
It was no better when the hour of temptation came. All resolutions were forgotten, all love to Christ buried. The present temptation closing with this carnal fear carried all before it. To handle this a little more distinctly, I shall consider the means of safety from the power of temptation, if we enter therein, that may be expected from ourselves, and that in general as to the spring and rise of them, and in particular as to the ways of exerting that strength we have, or seem to have. 1. In general, all we can look for is from our hearts. What a man's heart is, that is he. But now what is the heart of a man in such a season? First, suppose a man is not a believer, but only a professor of the gospel. What can the heart of such an one do? Proverbs 10.20 The heart of the wicked is little worth. And surely that which is little worth in anything is not much worth in this. A wicked man may in outward things be of great use, but come to his heart. That is false, and a thing of naught. Now, withstanding of temptation is hard work, and when it comes like a flood, can such a rotten trifle as a wicked man's heart stand before it? But of these before, entering into temptation and apostasy is the same with them. Secondly, let it be whose heart it will, Proverbs 28:26. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. He that does so, be he what he will, in that he is foolish. Peter did so in his temptation. He trusted in his own heart. Though all men forsake thee, I will not. It was his folly. But why was it his folly? He shall not be delivered. It will not preserve him in snares. It will not deliver him in temptations. The heart of a man will promise him very fair before a temptation comes. Am I a dog, says Haziel, that I should do this thing? Though all men should deny thee, says Peter, I will not. Shall I do this evil? It cannot be. All the arguments that are suited to give check to the heart in such a condition are mustered up. Did not Peter think you do so? What? Deny my master, the Son of God, my Redeemer who loves me? Can such ingratitude, unbelief, rebellion befall me? I will not do it. Shall then a man rest in it, that his heart will be steadfast? Let the wise man answer, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. The heart is deceitful, Jeremiah 17, 9. We would not willingly trust anything wherein there is any deceit or guile. Here is that which is deceitful above all things. It, ha it hath a thousand shifts and treacheries that it will deal with. When it comes to the trial, every temptation will steal it away, Hosea 4.11. Generally, men's hearts deceive them no oftener than they do trust in them, and then they never fail so to do. Number two, consider the particular ways and means that such a heart has or can use to safeguard itself in the hour of temptation, and their insufficiency to that purpose will quickly appear. I shall instance in some few only. First, love of honor in the world, reputation and esteem in the church, obtained by former profession and walking is one of the heart's own weapons to defend itself in the hour of temptation. Shall such a one as I fly, I who have had such a reputation in the church of God, shall I now lose it by giving way to this lust, to this temptation, by closing with this or that public evil? This consideration hath such an influence on the spirits of some that they think it will be a shield and buckler against any assaults that may befall them. They will die a thousand times before they will forfeit that repute they have in the church of God. But alas, this is but a with or a new cord to bind a giant temptation with. What think you of the third part of the stars of heaven, Revelations 12.4? Had they not shone in the firmament of the church? Were they not sensible, more than enough, of their own honor, height, usefulness, and reputation? But when the dragon comes with his temptation, he casts them down to the earth. Yea, great temptations will make men who have not a better defense insensibly fortify themselves against that dishonor and disreputation that their ways are attended with. 
Do we not know instances yet living of some who have ventured on compliances with wicked men after the glory of a long and useful profession, and within a while finding themselves cast down thereby from their reputation with the saints, have hardened themselves against it, and ended in apostasy? Is John 15.6 this kept not Judas, it kept not Hymenaeus, nor Philetus, it kept not the stars of heaven, nor will it keep thee. Secondly, there is on the other side the consideration of shame, reproach, loss, and the like. This also men may put their trust in as a defense against temptations, and do not fear but to be safeguarded and preserved by it. They would not for the world bring that shame and reproach upon themselves that such and such miscarriages are attended with. Now besides that, this consideration extends itself only to open sins, such as the world takes notice of and abhors, and so is of no use at all in such cases as wherein pretenses and colors may be invented and used nor in public temptations to loose and careless walking, like those of our days, nor in cases that may be disputable in themselves, though expressly sinful to the consciences of persons under temptation, nor in heart sins, in all which in most other cases of temptation there are innumerable reliefs ready to be tendered to the heart against this consideration. Besides all this, I say, we see by experience how easily this cord is broken when once the heart begins to be entangled. Each corner of the land is full of examples to this purpose. Thirdly, they have yet that which outweighs these lesser considerations, namely, that they will not wound their own consciences and disturb their peace and bring themselves in danger of hell fire. This, surely, if anything, will preserve men in the hour of temptation. They will not lavish away their peace, nor venture their souls by running on God in the thick bosses of his buckler. What, what can be of more efficacy and prevalency? I confess this is of great importance. And oh, that it were more pondered than it is, that we laid more weight upon the preservation of our peace with God than we do. Yet I say that even this consideration in him who is otherwhere off from his watch, and doth not make it his work to follow the other rules insisted on, it will not preserve him. For first... The peace of such an one may be false peace or security, made up of presumption and false hopes. Yea, though he be a believer, it may be so. Such was David's peace after his sin, before Nathan came to him. Such was Laodicea's peace when ready to perish, and Sardis, her peace when dying. What would secure a soul that it is otherwise, seeing it is supposed that it doth not universally labor to keep the word of Christ's patience and to be watchful in all things? Think you that the peace of many in these days will be found to be true peace at last? Nothing less. They go alive down to hell, and death will have dominion over them in the morning. Now, if a man's peace be such, do you think that can preserve him which cannot preserve itself? It will give way at the first vigorous assault of a temptation in its height and hour. Like a broken reed, it will run into the hand of him that leaneth on it. But secondly, suppose the peace cared for and proposed to safeguard the soul be true and good, yet when all is laid up in this one bottom... When the hour of temptation comes, so many reliefs will be tendered against this consideration as will make it useless. This evil is small. It is questionable. It falls not openly and downright upon conscience. I do but fear consequences. It may be I may keep my peace notwithstanding. Others of the people of God have fallen and yet kept or recovered their peace. If it be lost for a season, it may be obtained again. I will not solicit its station any more. Or, though peace be lost, safety may remain. And a thousand sure pleas there are, which are all planted as batteries against this fort, 
so that it cannot long hold out. Thirdly, the fixing on this particular only is to make good one passage or entrance whilst the enemy assaults us round about. It is true a little armor would serve to defend a man if he might choose where his enemy should strike him, but we are commanded to take the whole armor of God if we intend to resist and stand. Ephesians 6. This we speak of is but one piece. And when our eye is only to that, temptation may enter and prevail twenty other ways. For instance, a man may be tempted to worldliness, unjust gain, revenge, vainglory, or the like. If he fortify himself alone with this consideration, he will not do this thing, and wound his conscience, and lose his peace, fixing his eye on this particular, and counting himself safe while he is not overcome on that hand. It may be neglect of private communion with God, sensuality and the like, do creep in, and he is not one jot in a better condition than if he had fallen under the power of that part of the temptation which was most visibly pressing on him. Experience gives to see that this doth and will fail also. There is no saint of God but puts a valuation on the peace he hath. Yet how many of them fail in the day of temptation? Fourthly, but yet they have another consideration also, and that is of vileness of sinning against God. How shall they do this thing and sin against God, the God of their mercies, of their salvation? How shall they wound Jesus Christ, who died for them? This surely cannot but preserve them. I answer first, we see every day this consideration failing also. There is no child of God that is overcome of temptation, but overcomes this consideration. It is not then a sure and infallible defensive. Secondly, this consideration is twofold. Either it expresses the thoughts of the soul with particular reference to the temptation contended with, and then it will not preserve it, or it expresses the universal habitual frame of heart that is in us, upon all accounts, and then it falls in with what I shall tender as a universal medicine and remedy in this case, and the process of this discourse whereof afterward. Consider the power of temptation, partly from what was showed before, from the effects and fruits of it in the saints of old, partly from other effects in general as we find ascribed to it, is one. It will darken the mind that a man shall not be able to make a right judgment of things, so as he did before he entered into it. As in the men of the world, the God of this world blinds their minds that they should not see the glory of Christ in the gospel, Second Corinthians 4, 4, and hoard them in wine, and new wine take away their hearts, Hosea 4, 11. So it is in the nature of every temptation, more or less, to take away the heart, or to darken the understanding of the person tempted. And this it does divers ways, first by fixing the imagination and the thoughts upon the object whereto it tends, so that the mind shall be diverted from the consideration of the things that would relieve and succor it in the state wherein it is. A man is tempted to apprehend that he is forsaken of God, that he is an object of his hatred, that he hath no interest in Christ. By the craft of Satan the mind shall be so fixed to the consideration of this state and condition, with the distress of it, that he shall not be able to manage any of the reliefs suggested and tendered to him against it, but follow the fullness of his own thoughts, shall walk on in darkness and have no light. I say, a temptation will so possess and fill the mind with thoughtfulness of itself and the matter of it, that it will take off from that clear consideration of things which otherwise it might and would have. And those things whereof the mind was wont to have a vigorous sense, to keep it from sin, will by this means come to have no force or efficacy with it. Nay, it will commonly bring men to that state and condition that when others to whom their estate is known 
are speaking to them the things that concern their deliverance and peace, their minds will be so possessed with the matter of their temptation as not at all to understand, scarce to hear one word that is spoken to them. Secondly, by woeful entangling of the affections, which, when they are engaged, what influence they have in blinding the mind and darkening the understanding is known. If any know it not, let him but open his eyes in these days, and he will quickly learn it. By what ways and means it is that engaged affections will but cloud the mind and darken it, I shall not now declare. Only I say, give me a man engaged in hope, love, fear, in reference to any particulars wherein he ought not, and I shall quickly show you wherein he is darkened and blinded. This, then, you will fail in if you enter into temptation. The present judgment you have of things will not be utterly altered, but darkened and rendered infirm to influence the will and master the affections. These, being set at liberty by temptation, will run on in madness. For with detestation of sin, abhorring of it, terrors of the Lord, sense of love, presence of Christ crucified, all depart, and leave the heart a prey to its enemy. Thirdly, temptation will give oil and fuel to our lusts, incite, provoke, and make them tumultuate and rage beyond measure. Tendering a lust, a corruption, a suitable object, advantage, occasion, it heightens and exasperates it, makes it for a season wholly predominant. So dealt it with carnal fear in Peter, with pride in Hezekiah, with covetousness in Achan, with uncleanness in David, with worldliness in Demas, with ambition in Diotrephes. It will lay the reins on the neck of a lust, and put spurs to the sides of it, that it may rush forward like a horse into the battle. A man knows not the pride, fury, madness of a corruption until it meet with a suitable temptation. And what now will a poor soul think to do? His mind is darkened, his affections entangled, his lusts inflamed and provoked, his relief is defeated. And what will be the issue of such a condition? 3. Consider that temptations are either public or private, and let us a little view the efficacy and power of them apart. There are public temptations, such as that mentioned, Revelations 3.10, that was to come upon the world to try them that dwell upon the earth or a combination of persecution and seduction for the trial of a careless generation of professors. Now concerning such a temptation, consider that first, it hath an efficacy in respect of God, who sends it to revenge the neglect and contempt of the gospel on the one hand, and treachery of false professors on the other. Hence it will certainly accomplish what it receives commission from him to do, when Satan offered his service to go forth and seduce Ahab that he might fall, God says to him, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. 1 Kings 22, verse 22. He is permitted as to his wickedness and commissionated as to the event and punishment intended. When the Christian world was to be given up to folly and false worship for their neglect of the truth and their naked, barren, fruitless, Christ-dishonoring profession, it is said of the temptation that fell upon them that God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, Second Thessalonians 2.11 that that comes so from God in a judiciary manner, hath a power with it, and shall prevail. That selfish, spiritually slothful, careless, and worldly frame of spirit, which in these days hath infected almost a body of professors, if it have a commission from God to kill hypocrites, to wound negligent saints, to break their bones and make them scandalous, that they may be ashamed, shall it not have a power and efficacy so to do? 
What work has the spirit of error made amongst us? Is it not from hence that as some men delight in not to retain God in their hearts, so he hath given them up to a reprobate mind? Romans 1.28 A man would think it strange, yea, it is a matter of amazement, to see persons of a sober spirit pretending to great things in the ways of God, overcome, captivated, ensnared, destroyed by weak means, sottish opinions, foolish imaginations, such as a man would think it impossible that they should ever lay hold on sensible or rational men, much less on professors of the gospel. But that which God will have to be strong, let us not think weak. No strength, but the strength of God can stand in the way of the weakest things of the world that are commissionated from God for any end or purpose whatever. Secondly, there is in such temptations the secret insinuation of examples in those that are accounted godly in our professors, Matthew 24:12. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The abounding of iniquity in some will insensibly cast water on the zeal and love of others, that by little and little it shall wax cold. Some begin to grow negligent, careless, worldly, wanton. They break the ice towards the pleasing of the flesh. At first others blame, judge them, perhaps reprove them. In a short space their love also waxes cold, and the brunt being over, they also conform to them, and are cast into the same mold with them. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Paul repeats this saying twice, 1 Corinthians 5, 6, and Galatians 5, 9. He would have us take notice of it. And it is of the danger of the infection of the whole body from the ill examples of some whereof he speaks. We know how insensibly leaven proceeds to give a savor to the whole, so it is termed a root of bitterness that springs up and defiles many. Hebrews 12:15. If one little piece of leaven, if one bitter root, may endanger the whole, how much more when there are many roots of that nature and much leaven is scattered abroad. It is easy following a multitude to do evil and saying, A conspiracy, to them to whom the people say, A conspiracy. Would any one have thought it possible that such and such professors in our days should have fallen into ways of self, of flesh, of the world, to play at cards, dice, revel, dance, to neglect family, closet duties, to be proud, haughty, ambitious, worldly, covetous, oppressive, or that they should be turned away after foolish, vain, ridiculous opinions, deserting the gospel of Christ, in which too lies the great temptation that has come on us, the inhabitants of this world, to try us. But does not every man see that this has come to pass? And may we not see how it is come to pass? Some loose, empty professors, who had never more than a form of godliness when they had served their turn of that, began the way to them. Then others began a little to comply, and to please the flesh in so doing. This by little and little hath reached even the top boughs and branches of our profession, until almost all flesh hath corrupted its way. And he that departeth from these iniquities makes his name a prey, if not his person. Thirdly, public temptations are usually accompanied with strong reasons and pretenses that are too hard for men, or at least insensibly prevail on them to an undervaluation of the evil whereunto the temptation leads, to give strength to that complicated temptation which in these days has even cast down the people of God from their excellency, hath cut their locks, and made them become like other men. 
How full is this world of specious pretenses and pleadings, as there is a liberty and freedom of Christians delivered from a bondage frame. This is a door that, in my own observation, I have seen sundry going out at, into sensuality and apostasy, beginning at a light conversation, proceeding to a neglect of the Sabbath, public and private duties, ending in dissoluteness and profaneness. And then there is leaving of public things to providence, being contented with what is, things good in themselves, but disputed into wretched, carnal compliances, and the utter ruin of all zeal for God, the interest of Christ, or his people in the world. These and the like considerations, joined with the ease and plenty, the greatness and promotion of professors, is so brought things about, that whereas we have by providence shifted places with the men of the world, we have by sin shifted spirits with them also. We are like a plantation of men carried into a foreign country. In a short space, they degenerate from the manners of the people from whence they came, and fall into that of the country whereunto they are brought, as if there were something in the soil and the air that transformed them. Give me leave a little to follow my similitude. He that should see the prevailing party of these nations, many of those in rule, power, favor, with all their adherents, and remember that they were a colony of Puritans, whose habitation was in a low place, as the prophet speaks of the city of God, translated by a high hand to the mountains they now possess, cannot but wonder how soon they have forgot the customs, manners, ways of their own old people, and are cast into the old of them that went before them in the places whereunto they are translated. I speak of us all, especially of us who are amongst the lowest of the people, where perhaps this iniquity doth most abound. What were those before us that we are not? What did they that we do not? Prosperity has slain the foolish and wounded the wise. Number two, suppose the temptation is private. This has been spoken to before. I shall add two things. First, its union and incorporation with lust, whereby it gets within the soul and lies at the bottom of its actings. John tells us, first epistle to 16, that the things that are in the world are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Now, it is evident that all these things are principally in the subject, not in the object in the heart, not in the world. But they are said to be in the world because the world gets into them, mixes itself with them, unites, incorporates. As faith and the promises are said to be mixed, Hebrews 4, 2, so our lust and temptation are mixed. They twine together, receive mutual improvement from one another, grow each of them higher and higher by the mutual strength they administer to one another. Now by this means temptation gets so deep in the heart that no contrary reasonings can reach to it. Nothing but what can kill the lust can conquer the temptation. Like leprosy that has mingled itself with the wall, the wall itself must be pulled down, or the leprosy will not be cured. Like a gangrene that mixes poison with the blood and spirits and cannot be separated from the place where it is, but both must be cut off together. For instance, in David's temptation to uncleanness, ten thousand considerations might have been taken in to stop the mouth of the temptation, but it had united itself with his lust, and nothing but the killing of that could destroy it, or get him the conquest. This deceives many a one. They have some pressing temptation that... Having got some advantages is urgent upon them. They pray against it, oppose it with all powerful considerations, such as whereof every one seems sufficient to conquer and destroy it, at least to overpower it, that it should never be troublesome any more. But no good is done, no ground is got or obtained, yea, it grows upon them more and more. 
What is the reason of it? It hath incorporated and united itself with the lust, and is safe from all the opposition they make. If they would make work indeed, they are to set upon the whole of the lust itself, their ambition, pride, worldliness, sensuality, or whatever it be, that the temptation is united with. All other dealings with it are like tamperings with a prevailing gangrene. The part or whole may be preserved a little while in great torment. Excision or death must come at last. The soul may cruciate itself for a season with such a procedure, but it comes to this. Its lust must die, or the soul must die. Secondly, in what part soever of the soul the lust be seated wherewith the temptation is united, it draws after it the whole soul by one means or other, and so prevents or anticipates any opposition. Suppose it be a lust of the mind, as there are lusts of the mind and uncleanness of the spirit, such as ambition, vainglory, and the like, what a world of ways hath the understanding to bridle the affections that they should not so tenaciously cleave to God, seeing in what it aimeth at there is so much to give them contentment and satisfaction. It will not only prevent all the reasonings of the mind which it doth necessarily, being like a bloody infirmity in the eyes, presenting all things to the common sense and perception in that hue and color, but it will draw the whole soul on other accounts and collateral considerations into the same frame. It promises the whole a share in the spoil aimed at, as Judas's money that he first desired from covetousness was to be shared among all his lusts, or be it in the more sensual part, the first possesseth the affections, what prejudices they will bring upon the understanding, how will they bribe it to an acquiescence, what arguments, what hopes they will supply it with, cannot easily be expressed, as was before showed. In brief, there is no particular temptation, but when it is in its hour, it hath such a consideration of assistance from things good, evil, indifferent, is fed by so many considerations that seem to be most alien and foreign to it, in some cases has such specious pleas and pretenses that its strength will easily be acknowledged." Consider the end of any temptation. This is Satan's end and sin's end, that is, the dishonor of God and the ruin of our souls. Consider what has been the issue of any former temptations that thou hast had. Have they not defiled thy conscience, disquieted thy peace, weakened thee in thy obedience, clouded the face of God? Though thou wast not prevailed on to the outward evil or utmost issue of thy temptation, yet hast thou not been foiled? Hast not thy soul been sullied and grievously perplexed with it? Yea, didst thou ever in thy life come fairly off, without sensible loss, from any temptation almost that thou hadst to deal with? And would you willingly be entangled again? If you are at liberty, take heed, enter no more, if it be possible, lest a worse thing happen to you. These, I say, are some of those many considerations that might be insisted on to manifest the importance of the truth proposed and the fullness of our concernment in taking care that we enter not into temptation. Against what has been spoken, some objections that secretly insinuate themselves into the souls of men, and have an efficacy to make them negligent and careless in this thing, which is of such importance to them, a duty of such indispensable necessity to them who attend to walk with God in any peace or with any faithfulness, are to be considered and removed. And they are these that follow. Objection 1. Why should we so fear and labor to avoid temptation? James 1, 2, we are commanded to count it all joy when we fall into divers temptations. Now certainly I need not solicitously avoid the falling into that which, when I am falling into, I am to count it all joy, to which I answer, number one, 
You will not hold by this rule in all things, namely, that a man need not seek to avoid that which, when he cannot but fall into, it is his duty to rejoice therein. The same apostle bids the rich rejoice that they are made low, chapter 1, 10, and without doubt to him who is acquainted with the goodness and wisdom and love of God in his dispensations, in every condition that is needful for him, it will be a matter of rejoicing to him. But yet, how few rich, godly men can you persuade not to take heed and use all lawful means that they be not made poor and low, and in most cases the truth is that were their sin not to do so. It is our business to make good our stations and to secure ourselves as we can. If God alter our condition, we are to rejoice in it. If the temptations here mentioned befall us, we may have cause to rejoice, but not if, by a neglect of duty, we fall into them. Number two, temptations are taken two ways. One, passively and merely materially, for such things as are, or in some cases may be, temptations. Or two, actively, for such as do entice to sin. James speaks of temptations in the first sense only, for having said, Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Verse 2, he adds, verse 12, Blessed is a man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life. But now, whereas a man might say, If this be so, then temptations are good and from God. No, says James, take temptation in such a sense as that it is a thing enticing and leading to sin. So God tempts none, but every man is tempted of his own lust, verses 13 and 14. To have such temptations, to be tempted to sin, that is not the blessed thing I intend. But the enduring of afflictions that God sends for the trial of our faith, that is a blessed thing. So that though I must count it all joy when through the will of God I fall into divers afflictions for my trial, which yet have the matter of temptation in them, yet I am to use all care and diligence that my lust have no occasions or advantages given to it to tempt me to sin. Objection 2. But was not our Savior Christ himself tempted? And is it evil to be brought into the same state and condition with him? Yea, it is not only said that he was tempted, but his being so is expressed as a thing advantageous and conducing to his mercifulness as our priest, Hebrews 2, 17 and 18, and that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted, and he makes it a ground of a great promise to his disciples that they had abode with him in his temptations, Luke 22, 28. Answer, it is true our Savior was tempted, but yet his temptations are reckoned among the evils that befell him in the days of his flesh, things that came on him through the malice of the world, and the prince thereof. He did not willfully cast himself into temptation, which he said was to tempt the Lord our God, Matthew 4, 7, as indeed willingly to enter into any temptation is highly to tempt God. Now our condition is so that, use the greatest diligence and watchfulness that we can, yet we shall be sure to be tempted, and be made like Christ therein. This hinders not but that it is our duty to the utmost to prevent our falling into them, and that namely on this account. Christ did only the suffering part of temptation when he entered into it. We have also the sinning part of it. When the prince of this world came to Christ, he had no part in him. But when he comes to us, he has so in us. So that though in one effect of temptations, namely trials and disquietness, we are made like to Christ, and so are to rejoice as far as by any means it is produced, yet by another we are made unlike to him, which is our being defiled and entangled, and are therefore to seek by all means to avoid them. We never come off like Christ, who of us enter into temptation and are not defiled. Objection 3. But what need this great endeavor and carefulness? Is it not said that God is faithful, who will not suffer us to be tempted above what we are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape? 
1 Corinthians 10.13, and knoweth he how to deliver the godly out of temptation, 2 Peter 2.9. What need we then be solicitous that we enter not into them? Answer, I much question what assistance he will have from God in his temptation, who willingly enters into it, because he supposes God has promised to deliver him out of it. The Lord knows that, through the craft of Satan, the subtlety and malice of the world, the deceitfulness of sin that does so easily beset us, when we have done our utmost, yet we shall enter into diverse temptations. In his love, care, tenderness, and faithfulness, he has provided such a sufficiency of grace for us, that they shall not utterly prevail to make an everlasting separation between him and our souls." Yet I have three things to say to this objection. Number one, he that willfully or negligently enters into temptation has no reason in the world to promise himself any assistance from God or any deliverance from the temptation whereunto he is entered. The promise is made to them whom temptations do befall in their way, whether they will or not, not them that willfully fall into them, that run out of their way to meet with them. And therefore the devil, as is usually observed, when he tempted our Savior, left out that expression of the text of Scripture which he rested to his purpose, all thy ways. The promise of deliverance is to them who are in their ways, whereof this is one principle, to beware of temptation. Number two, though there be a sufficiency of grace provided for all the elect, that they shall by no temptation fall utterly from God, yet it would make any gracious heart to tremble, to think what dishonor to God, what scandal to the gospel, what woeful darkness and disquietness they may bring upon their own souls, though they perish not. And they who are scared by nothing but fear of hell, on whom other consideration is short thereof, have no influence, and my apprehension have more reason to fear it than perhaps they are aware of. Number three, to enter on temptation on this account is to venture on sin, which is the same with continuing in sin, that grace may abound, Romans 6, 1 and 2 which the apostle rejects the thoughts of with greatest detestation. Is it not a madness for a man willingly to suffer the ship wherein he is to split itself on a rock to the irrecoverable loss of his merchandise because he supposes he shall in his own person swim safely to shore on a plank? Is it less in him who will hazard the shipwreck of all his comfort, peace, joy, and so much of the glory of God in honor of the gospel, as he is entrusted with, merely on supposition that his soul shall yet escape? These things a man would think did not deserve to be mentioned, and yet with such as these do poor souls sometimes delude themselves. Chapter 4 these things being premised in general, I proceed to the consideration of three particular cases arising from the truth proposed. The first whereof relates to the thing itself, the second to the time or season thereof, and the last to our deportment in reference to the prevention of the evil treated of. First, then, it may be inquired, number one, how a man may know when he is entered into temptation. Number two, what directions are to be given for the preventing of our entering into temptation? Number three, what seasons there are wherein a man may and ought to fear that an hour of temptation is at hand? One, how shall a man know whether he be entered into temptation or not is our first inquiry. I say then first... When a man is drawn into any sin, he may be sure that he hath entered into temptation. All sin is from temptation, James 1.14. Sin is a fruit that comes only from that root. Though a man be never so suddenly or violently surprised in or with any sin, yet it is from some temptation or other that he has been so surprised. So the Apostle Galatians 6.1. If a man be surprised... Overtaken with a fault, yet he was tempted to it, for, says he, consider thyself, lest thou also be tempted. That is, as he was when he was so surprised, as it were, at 
unawares. This men sometimes take no notice of to their great disadvantage. When they are overtaken with a sin, they set themselves to repent of that sin, but do not consider the temptation that was the cause of it, to set themselves against that also, to take care that they enter no more into it. Hence are they quickly again entangled by it, though they have the greatest detestation of the sin itself that can be expressed. He that would indeed get the conquest over any sin must consider his temptations to it, and strike at the root. Without deliverance from thence he will not be healed. This is a folly that possesses many who have yet a quick and living sense of sin. They are sensible of their sins, not of their temptations, are displeased with the bitter fruit, but cherish the poisonous root. Hence, in the midst of their humiliations for sin, they will continue in those ways, those societies, and the pursuits of those ends which have occasioned that sin, of which more afterwards, secondly... Temptations have several degrees. Some rise to such an height, do so press on the soul, so cruciate and disquiet it, so fight against all opposition that is made to it, that it must needs be past all doubt to him who is so assaulted, that is a peculiar power of temptation that he is to wrestle with. When a fever rages, a man knows he is sick, unless his distemper have made him mad. The lusts of men, as James tells us, entice, draw away, and seduce them to sin. But this they do of themselves without peculiar instigation, in a more quiet, even and sedate manner. If they grow violent, if they hurry the soul up and down, give it no rest, the soul may know that they have got the help of temptation to their assistance. Take an empty vessel and put it into some stream that is in its course to the sea. It will infallibly be carried there according to the course and speed of the stream. But let strong winds arise upon it. It will be driven with violence on every bank and rock until being broken in pieces it is swallowed up of the ocean. Men's lusts will infallibly, if not mortified in the death of Christ, carry them into eternal ruin. But oftentimes without much noise, according to the course of the stream of their corruptions. But let the wind of strong temptations befall them, they are hurried into innumerable scandalous sins, and so broken upon all accounts, are swallowed up in eternity. So is it in general with men, so in particular. Hezekiah had the root of pride in him always, yet it did not make him run up and down to show his treasure and his riches until he fell into temptation by the ambassadors of the king of Babylon. So had David, yet could he keep off from numbering the people until Satan stood up and provoked him and solicited him to do it. Judas was covetous from the beginning, yet he did not contrive to satisfy it by selling of his master until the devil entered into him and he thereby into temptation. The like may be said of Abraham, Jonah, Peter, and the rest. So that when any lust or corruption, whatever tumultuates and disquieteth the soul, puts it with violence on sin, let the soul know that it hath got the advantage of some outward temptation, though as yet it perceiveth not wherein, or at least has become itself a peculiar temptation by some incitation or provocation that has befallen it, and is to be looked to more than ordinarily. Number three. Entering into temptation may be seen in the lesser degrees of it, as, for instance, when the heart begins secretly to like the matter of the temptation, and is content to feed it and increase it by any ways that it may without downright sin. In particular, a man begins to be in repute for piety, wisdom, learning, or the like. He is spoken of much to that purpose. His heart is tickled to hear of it, and his pride and ambition affected with it. If this man now, with all his strength, ply the things from whence his repute and esteem and glory amongst men do spring, with a secret eye to have it increased, he is entering into temptation, which, if he take not heed, will quickly 
render him a slave of lust. So it was with Jehu. He perceived that his repute for zeal began to grow abroad, and he got honor by it. Jonadab comes in his way, a good and holy man. Now, thinks Jehu, I have an opportunity to grow in honor of my zeal. So he calls Jonadab to him, and to work he goes most seriously. The things he did were good in themselves, but he was entered into temptation, and served his lust in all that he did. So it was with many scholars. They find themselves esteemed and favored for their learning. This takes hold of the pride and ambition of their hearts, hence they set themselves to study with all diligence day and night, a thing good in itself. But they do it that they might satisfy the thoughts and words of men wherein they delight, and so in all they do they make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. It is true God oftentimes brings light out of this darkness and turns things to a better issue. After it may be a man has studied sundry years with an eye upon his lusts, his ambition, pride, and vainglory, rising early and going to bed late, to give them satisfaction, God comes in with his grace, turns the soul to himself, robs those Egyptian lusts, and so consecrates that to the use of the tabernacle which was provided for idols. Men may be thus entangled in better things than learning, even in the profession of piety, and their labor in the ministry, and the like. Some men's profession is a snare to them. They are in reputation and are much honored on the account of their profession and strict walking. This often falls out in the days wherein we live, wherein all things are carried by parties. Some find themselves on the accounts mentioned, perhaps, to be the glory of their party. If thoughts hereof secretly insinuate themselves into their hearts and influence them into more than ordinary diligence and activity in their way and profession, they are entangled, and instead of aiming at more glory, had need lie in the dust in the sense of their own vileness. And so close is this temptation that oftentimes it requires no food to feed upon, but that he who is entangled with it do avoid all means and ways of honor and reputation, so that it can but whisper in the heart that the avoidance is honorable. The same may be the condition with men, as was said, in preaching the gospel, in the work of the ministry. Many things in that work may yield them esteem, their ability, their plainness, their frequency, their success, and all in this sense may be fuel unto temptations. Let then a man know that when he likes that which he feeds his lust, and keeps it up by ways either good in themselves or not downright sinful, he is entered into temptation. Number four, when by a man's state or condition of life or any means whatever, it comes to pass that his lust and any temptation meet with occasions and opportunities for its provocation and stirring up, let that man know, whether he perceive it or not, that he is certainly entered into temptation. I told you before that to enter into temptation is not merely to be tempted, but so to be under the power of it is to be entangled by it. Now it is impossible almost for a man to have opportunities, occasions, advantages suited to his lust and corruption, but he will be entangled. If ambassadors come from the king of Babylon, Hezekiah's pride will cast him into temptation. If Haziel be king of Syria, his cruelty and ambition will make him to rage savagely against Israel. If the priests come with their pieces of silver, Judas's covetousness will instantly be at work to sell his master. And many instances of the like kind may, in the days wherein we live, be given. Some men think to play on the whole of the asp and not be stung, to touch pitch and not be defiled, to take fire in their clothes and not be burnt, but they will be mistaken. If thy business, course of life, societies, or whatever else it be of the like kind, do cast thee on such things, ways, persons, as suit thy lust or corruption, know that thou art entered into temptation, how thou wilt come out, God only knows." 
Let us suppose a man that hath any seeds of filthiness in his heart engaged in the course of his life, in society, light, vain, and foolish, what notice soever, little, great, or none at all, it be that he takes of it, he is undoubtedly entered into temptation. So is it with ambition in high places, passion in a multitude of perplexing affairs, polluted corrupt fancy in vain societies, and the perusal of idle books or treatises of vanity and folly. Fire in things combustible may more easily be induced to lie together without affecting each other than peculiar lusts and suitable objects or occasions for their exercise. Number 5. When a man is weakened, made negligent, or formal in duty, when he can omit duties or content himself with a careless, lifeless performance of them without delight, joy, or satisfaction to his soul, who had another frame formerly, let him know that though he may not be acquainted with the particular distemper wherein it consists, Yet, yet in something or other he is entered into temptation, which at length he will find evident to his trouble and peril. How many have we seen and known in our days who from a warm profession have fallen to be negligent, careless, indifferent in praying, reading, hearing, and the like? Give an instance of one who hath come off without a wound, and I dare say you may find out an hundred for him that have manifested themselves to have been asleep on top of the mast. They were in the jaws of some vile temptation or other that afterward brought forth bitter fruit in their lives and ways. From some few returners from folly we have seen every day of these doleful complaints made. Oh, I neglected private prayer. I did not meditate on the word, nor attend to hearing, but rather despise these things. And yet I said I was rich and wanted nothing. Little did I consider that this unclean lust was ripening in my heart. This atheism, these abominations were fomenting there. This, this is a certain role. If his heart grow cold, negligent, or formal in duties of the worship of God, and that either as to the matter or manner of them who hath had another frame, one temptation or other has laid hold upon him. Worldliness or pride or uncleanness or self-seeking or malice and envy or one thing or other hath possessed his spirit. Gray hairs are here and there upon him, though he perceive it not. And this is to be observed as to the manner of duties as well as to the matter. Men may, upon some sinister accounts, especially for the satisfaction of their consciences, keep up in frequent duties of religion, as to the substance and matter of them, when they have no heart to them, no life in them, as to the spiritually required in their performance. Sardis kept up the performance of duties and had therefore a name to live, but lacked spiritual life in their performances and was therefore dead. Revelation 3.1 as it is in distempers of the body, if a man finds his spirits faint, his heart oppressed, his head heavy, the whole person indisposed, though he do not yet actually burn nor rave, yet will he cry, I fear I am entering into a fever, I am so out of order and indisposed. A man may do so in this sickness of the soul, if he find his pulse not beat aright and evenly towards duties of worship and communion with God, if his spirit be low and his heart faint in them, let him conclude, though his lust do not yet burn nor rage, that he is entered into temptation, and it is high time for him to consider the particular causes of his distemper. If the head be heavy in slumber in the things of grace, if the heart be cold in duties, evil lies at the door, and if such a soul do escape a great temptation to sin, yet it shall not escape a great temptation by desertion. The spouse cries, I sleep, Canticles 5-2, and that she had put off her coat and could not put it on had an indisposition to duties and communion with Christ. What is the next news you have of her? Verse 6. Her beloved had withdrawn himself. 
Christ was gone, and she seeks him long and finds him not. There is such a suitableness between the new nature that is wrought and created in believers and the duties of the worship of God that they will not be parted nor kept asunder unless it be by the interposition of some disturbing distemper. The new creature feeds upon them, is strengthened and increased by them, finds sweetness in them, yea, meets in them with its God and Father, so that it cannot but of itself, unless made sick by some temptation, delight in them, and desire to be in the exercise of them. This frame is described in the 119th Psalm throughout. It is not, I say, cast out of this frame and temper unless it be oppressed and disordered by one secret temptation or other. Sundry other evidences there are of a soul's entering into temptation, which upon inquiry it may discover. I propose this to take off the security that we are apt to fall into and to manifest what is a peculiar duty that we are to apply ourselves to in the special seasons of temptation. For he that is already entered into temptation is to apply himself to means for disentanglement, not to labor to prevent his entering in. How this may be done I shall afterward declare. Of Temptation Directions Against Temptation Chapter 5 Having seen the danger of entering into temptation, and also having discovered the ways and seasons whereby and wherein men usually do so, our second inquiry is, what general directions may be given to preserve a soul from that condition that has been spoken of? And we see our Savior's direction in the place spoken of before, Matthew twenty six forty one. He sums up all in these two words. Watch and pray. I shall a little labor to unfold them, and show what is enwrapped and contained in them, and that both jointly and severally. There is included in them a clear abiding apprehension of the great evil that there is in entering into temptation, that which a man watches and prays against. He looks upon his evil to him, and by all means to be avoided. This, then, is the first direction. Always bear in mind the great danger that it is for any soul to enter into temptation. It is a woeful thing to consider what slight thoughts the most have of the thing. So men can keep themselves from sin itself in open action. They are content. They scarce aim at more. On any temptation in the world, all sorts of men will venture at any time. How will young men put themselves on any company, any society at first, being delighted with evil company, than with the evil of the company? How vain are all admonitions and exhortations to them to take heed of such persons, debauched in themselves, corruptors of others, destroyers of souls. At first they will venture on the company, abhorring the thoughts of practicing their lewdness, but what is the issue? Unless it be here or there one whom God snatches with a mighty hand from the jaws of destruction, they are all lost, and become after a while in love with the evil which at first they abhorred. This open door to the ruin of souls is too evident, and woeful experience makes it no less evident that it is almost impossible to fasten upon many poor creatures any fear or dread of temptation, who yet will profess a fear and abhorrency of sin. Would it were only thus with young men, such as are unaccustomed to the yoke of the Lord? What sort of man is free from this folly in one thing or other? How many professors have I known that would plead for their liberty, as they called it? They could hear anything, all things, all sorts of men, all men. They would try all things whether they came to them in the way of God or not and on that account would run to hear and to attend to every broacher of false and abominable opinions, every seducer, though stigmatized by the generality of the saints. For such an one they had their liberty, they could do it, but the opinions they hated as much as any. What has been the issue? 
I scarce ever knew any come off without a wound. The most have had their faith overthrown. Let no man then pretend to fear sin that does not fear temptation to it. They are too nearly allied to be separated. Satan has put them so together that it is very hard for any man to put them asunder. He hates not the fruit who delights in the root. When men see that such ways, such companies, such courses, such businesses, such studies and aims do entangle them, make them cold, careless, or quench coals to them, and dispose them to even universal and constant obedience, if they adventure on them, sin lies at the door. It is a tender frame of spirit, sensible of its own weakness and corruption, of the craft of Satan, of the evil of sin, of the efficacy of temptation that can perform its duty. And yet until we bring our hearts to this frame upon the considerations before mentioned, or the like that may be proposed, we shall never free ourselves from sinful entanglements. Boldness upon temptation, springing from several pretenses, has, as is known, ruined innumerable professors in these days, and still continues to cast many down from their excellency. Nor have I the least hope of a more fruitful profession amongst us, until I see more fear of temptation. Sin will not long seem great or heavy to any to whom temptation seem light or small. This is the first thing enwrapped in this general direction, the daily exercise of our thoughts with an apprehension of the great danger that lies in entering into temptation is required of us. Grief of the Spirit of God, disquietment of our own souls, loss of peace, hazard of eternal welfare lies at the door. If the soul be not prevailed with to the observation of this direction, all that ensues will be of no value. Temptation despise will conquer, and if the heart be made tender and watchful here, half the work of securing a good conversation is over. And let not him go any further who resolves not to improve this direction in a daily conscientious observation of it. There is this in it also, that it is not a thing in our own power to keep and preserve ourselves from entering into temptation. Therefore are we to pray that we may be preserved from it, because we cannot save ourselves. This is another means of preservation. As we have no strength to resist a temptation when it does come, when we are entered into it, but shall fall under it without a supply of sufficiency of grace from God, so to reckon that we have no power or wisdom to keep ourselves from entering into temptation, but must be kept by the power and wisdom of God, is a preserving principle, First Peter 1 Peter 1.5. We are in all things kept by the power of God. This our Savior instructs us in, not only by directing us to pray that we be not led into temptation, but also by his own praying for us that we may be kept from it. John 17:15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. That is, the temptations of the world to evil, to sin. Out of the evil, that is, in the world, that is, temptation, which is all that is evil in the world, or from the evil one who in the world makes use of the world to temptation. Christ prays his Father to keep us and instructs us to pray that we be so kept. It is not then a thing in our own power. The ways of our entering into temptation are so many, various and imperceptible, the means of it so efficacious and powerful, the entrances of it so deceitful, subtle and sensible and plausible, our weakness, our unwatchfulness, so unspeakable that we cannot in the least keep or preserve ourselves from it. We fail both in wisdom and power for this work. Let the heart then commune with itself and say, I am poor and weak, 
Satan is subtle, cunning, powerful, watching constantly for advantages against my soul. The world earnest, pressing, and full of specious pleas, innumerable pretenses, and ways of deceit. My own corruption violent and tumultuating, enticing, entangling, conceiving sin and warring in me, against me. Occasions and advantages of temptation innumerable in all things I have done or suffer, in all businesses and persons with whom I converse. The first beginnings of temptation, insensible and plausible, so that left to myself, I shall not know that I am ensnared until my bonds be made strong and sin has got ground in my heart. Therefore, on God alone will I rely for preservation, and continually will I look up to Him on that account. This will make the soul be always committing itself to the care of God, arresting itself on Him, and to do nothing, undertake nothing, and so on, without asking counsel of Him, so that a double advantage will arise from the observation of this direction, both of singular use for the soul's preservation from the evil feared. Number one, the engagement of the grace and compassion of God, who is called the fatherless and helpless to rest upon him. Nor did ever soul fill a supplies who in a sense of lack rolled itself on him on the account of its gracious invitation. The keeping of it in such a frame as on various accounts is useful for its preservation. He that looks to God for assistance in the due manner is both sensible of his danger and conscientiously careful in the use of means to preserve himself, which two of what importance they are in this case may easily be apprehended by them who have their hearts exercised in these things. This also is in it, act faith on the promise of God for preservation. To believe that he will preserve us is a means of preservation, for this God will certainly do or make a way for us to escape out of temptation if we fall into it under such a believing frame. We are to pray for what God has promised. Our requests are to be regulated by his promises and commands, which are of the same extent. Faith closes with the promises and so finds relief in this case. This James instructs us in chapter 1, 5 to 7. What we lack, we must ask of God, but we must ask in faith, for otherwise we must not think that we shall receive anything of the Lord. This then also is in the direction of our Savior that we act faith on the promises of God for our preservation out of temptation. He hath promised that he will keep us in all our ways, that we shall be directed in a way that, though we are fools, we shall not err therein. Isaiah 35, 8. That he will lead us guide us and deliver us from the evil one. Set faith on work on these promises of God and expect a good and comfortable issue. It is not easily conceived what a train of grace's faith is attended with when it goes forth to meet Christ in the promises, nor what a power for the preservation of the soul lies in this thing. But I have spoken to this elsewhere. Mortification of sin in believers also narrated for the chapel library. Number four, weigh these things severally, and first take prayer into consideration. To pray that we enter not into temptation is a means to preserve us from it. Gloria things are by all men that know aught of those things spoken of this duty, and yet the truth is, not one half of its excellency, power, and efficacy is known. It is not my business to speak of it in general, but this I say is to my present purpose. He that would be little in temptation, let him be much in prayer. This calls in the suitable help and succor that is laid up in Christ for us, Hebrews 4.16. This casts our souls into a frame of opposition to every temptation. When Paul had given instruction for the taking to ourselves the whole armor of God that we may resist and stand in the time of temptation, he adds his general close of the whole, Ephesians 6.18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, with watching thereunto, with all perseverance and supplication. Without this, all the rest will be of no efficacy for the end proposed, and therefore consider what weight he lays on it. 
praying always, that is, at all times and seasons, or be always ready and prepared for the discharge of that duty. Luke 18.1, Ephesians 6.18, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, putting forth all kinds of desires to God that are suited to our condition according to His will, in which we are assisted in by the Spirit, and watching thereunto, lest we be diverted by anything whatever, and that not for a little while, but with all perseverance, continuance lengthen out to the utmost, so shall we stand. The soul so framed is in a sure posture, and this is one of the means without which this work will not be done. If we do not abide in prayer, we shall abide in cursed temptations. Let this then be another direction. Abide in prayer, and that expressly to this purpose that we enter not into temptation. Let this be one part of our daily contending with God, that He would preserve our souls and keep our hearts in our ways, that we be not entangled, that His good and wise providence will order our ways and affairs, that no pressing temptation befall us, that He would give us diligence, carefulness, and watchfulness over our own ways. So shall we be delivered when others are held with the cords of their own folly. Chapter 6 The other part of our Savior's direction, namely to watch, is more general and extends itself to many particulars. I shall fix on some things that are contained therein. Number 3. Watch the seasons wherein men usually do enter into temptation. There are sundry reasons wherein an hour of temptation is commonly at hand and will unavoidably seize upon the soul unless it be delivered by mercy and the use of watchfulness. When we are under such a season, then are we peculiarly to be upon our guard that we enter not into, that we fall not under the power of temptation. Some of those seasons may be named... Number one, a season of unusual outward prosperity is usually accompanied with an hour of temptation. Prosperity and temptation go together. Yea, prosperity is a temptation, many temptations, and that because without imminent supplies of grace it is apt to cast a soul into a frame and temper exposed to any temptation, and provides it with fuel and food for all. It hath provision for lust and darts for Satan. The wise man tells us that the prosperity of fools destroys him, Proverbs 1.32. It hardens him in their way, makes them despise instruction, and put the evil day whose terror should influence him into amendment far from them. Without a special assistance, it hath an inconceivably malignant influence on believers themselves. Hence Agar prays against riches because of the temptation that attends them. Lest, saith he, I be full and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? Proverbs 38-9. Lest, being filled with them, he should forget the Lord. As God complains that his people did, Hosea 13-6. We know how David was mistaken in this case, Psalm 36. I said in my prosperity I shall never be moved. All is well, and will be well. But what was at hand? What lay at the door that David thought not of? Verse 7. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. God was ready to hide his face, and David to enter into a temptation of desertion, and he knew it not. As in, to a prosperous condition, I shall not run cross to Solomon's counsel. In the day of prosperity rejoice, Ecclesiastes 7.14. Rejoice in the God of thy mercies, who does thee good in his patience and forbearance, notwithstanding all thy unworthiness. Yet I may add to it, from the same fountain of wisdom, consider also, lest evil lie at the door. A man in that state is in the midst of snares. Satan has many advantages against him. Him. He forges darts out of all his enjoyments, and if he wash not, he will be entangled before he is aware. Thou wantest that which should poison ballast thy heart. Formality in religion will be apt to creep upon thee, and that lays the soul open to all temptations in their full power and strength.
Satisfaction and delight in creature comforts, the poison of the soul will be apt to grow upon thee. In such a time be vigilant, be circumspect, or thou will be surprised. Job says that in his affliction God made his heart soft, chapter 23:16. There is a hardness, an insensible lack of spiritual sense gathered in prosperity that if not washed against will expose the heart to the deceits of sin and baits of Satan. Watch and pray in this season. Many men's negligence in it has cost them dear. Their woeful experience cries out to take heed. Blessed is he that fears always, but especially in a time of prosperity. Number two, as in part was manifested before, a time of the slumber of grace, of neglect in communion with God, of formality and duty, is a season to be washed in, is that which has certainly some other temptation attending it. Let a soul in such an estate awake and look about him. His enemy is at hand, and he is ready to fall into such a condition as may cost him dear all the days of his life. His present estate is bad enough in itself, but it is an indication of that which is worse that lies at the door. The disciples that were with Christ in the mount had not only a bodily, but a spiritual drowsiness upon them. What says our Savior to them? Arise! Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. We know how near one of them was to a bitter hour of temptation, and not watching as he ought, he immediately entered into it. I mentioned before the case of the spouse, Canticles 5, 2-8. She slept and was drowsy and unwilling to gird up herself to a vigorous performance of duties in a way of quick active communion with Christ, before she is aware she has lost her beloved, then she moans, inquires, cries, endures, woundings, reproaches, and all, before she obtains him again. Consider then, O poor soul, thy state and condition. Does thy light burn dim? Or though it give to others as great a blaze as formerly, yet thou seest not so clearly the face of God in Christ by it as thou hast done. Second Corinthians 4, 6. Is thy zeal cold? Or if it do the same works as formerly, yet thy heart is not warm with the love of God and to God in them as formerly, but only thou proceedest in the course thou hast been in? Are you negligent in the duties of praying or hearing? Or if you do observe them, you do it not with that life and vigor as formerly? Do you flag in your profession? Or if you keep it up, yet your wills are oiled by some sinister respects from within or without. Does your delight in the people of God grow faint and cold? Or is your love to them changing from that which is purely spiritual into that which is very carnal, upon the account of suitableness of principles and natural spirits, if not worse foundations? If you are drowsing in such a condition as this, Take heed, you are falling into some woeful temptation that will break all your bones and give you wounds that shall stick by you all the days of your life. Yea, when you awake, you will find that it has indeed laid hold of you already, though you perceived it not. It has smitten and wounded you, though you have not complained nor sought relief or healing. Such was the state of the church of Sardis, Revelation 3.2. The things that remained were ready to die. Be, wa Be watchful, says our Savior, and strengthen them, or a worse thing will befall thee. If any that reads the word of this direction be in this condition, if he hath any regard of his poor soul, let him now awake before you be entangled beyond recovery. Take this warning from God. Despise it not. Number three, a season of great spiritual enjoyments is often by the malice of Satan and the weakness of our hearts turned into a season of danger as to this business of temptation. We know how the case stood with Paul, 2 Corinthians 12:7. He had glorious spiritual revelations of God and Jesus Christ. Instantly Satan falls upon him. A messenger from him buffets him, so that he earnestly begs its departure, but yet is left to struggle with it. God is pleased sometimes to give us the special discoveries of himself and his love, to fill the heart with his kindness. Christ takes us into the banqueting house and gives our hearts their fields of love. 
and this by some signal work of his spirit overpowering us with a sense of love and the unspeakable privilege of adoption, and so fills our souls with joy unspeakable and glorious. A man would think this was the securest condition in the world. What soul does not cry with Peter in the mount? It is good for me to be here, to abide here forever. But yet very frequently some bitter temptation is now at hand. Satan sees that, being possessed by the joy before us, we quickly neglect many ways of approach to our souls wherein he seeks and finds advantages against us. Is this in our state and condition? Does God at any time give us to drink of the rivers of pleasure that are at his right hand and satisfy our souls with his kindness as with marrow and fatness? Let us not say we shall never be moved. We know not how soon God may hide his face or a messenger from Satan may buffet us. Besides, there lies oftentimes a greater and worse deceit in this business. Men cheat their souls with their own fancies instead of a sense of God's love by the Holy Ghost. And when they are lifted up with their imaginations, it is not expressible how fearfully they are exposed to all manner of temptations. And how then are they able to find relief against their consciences from their own foolish fancies and deceivings wherewith they sport themselves? May we not see such every day, persons walking in the vanities and ways of this world, yet boasting of their sins of the love of God? Shall we believe them? We must not then believe truth itself, and how woeful then must their condition needs be. Number four. A fourth season is a season of self-confidence, then usually temptation is at hand. The case of Peter is clear to this. I will not deny thee, though all men should deny thee, I will not. Though I were to die for it, I would not do it. This said the poor man when he stood on the very brink of that temptation that cost him in the issue such bitter tears. And this taught him so far to know himself all his days, and gave him such acquaintance with the state of all believers, that when he had received more of the spirit than of power, yet he had less of confidence, and thought was fit that others should have so also, and therefore persuades all men to pass the time of their sojourning here in fear, First Peter 1.17, not to be confident and high as he was, lest as he did they fall. At the first trial he compares himself with others and vaunts himself above them. Though all men should forsake thee, yet I will not. He fears every man more than himself. But when our Savior afterward comes to him and puts him directly upon the comparison, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? John 21:15. He is done comparing himself with others, and only cries, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He will lift up himself above others no more. Such a season oftentimes falls out. Temptations are abroad in the world. False doctrines with innumerable other allurements and provocations. We are ready, everyone, to be very confident that we shall not be surprised with them. Though all men should fall into these follies, yet we would not. Surely we shall never go off from our walking with God. It is impossible our hearts should be so sottish. But, says the Apostle, be not high-minded, but fear. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Would you think that Peter, who had walked on the sea with Christ, confessed him to be the Son of God, been with him in the mount, when he heard a voice from the excellent glory, should at the word of a servant girl, when there is no legal inquisition after him, no process against him, nor any one in his condition, instantly fall a-cursing and swearing that he knew him not? Let them take heed of self-confidence, who have any mind to take heed of sin." And this is the first thing in our watching, to consider well the seasons wherein temptation usually makes its approaches to the soul, and be armed against them. And these are some of the seasons wherein temptations are nigh at hand. Chapter 7 That part of watchfulness against temptation which we have considered regards the outward means, occasions, and advantages of temptation. Proceed we now to that which respects the heart itself, which is wrought upon and entangled by temptation. 
watching or keeping of the heart, which above all keepings we are obliged to, comes within the compass of this duty also. For the right performance whereof, take these ensuing directions. Number one, let him that would not enter into temptation labor to know his own heart, to be acquainted with his own spirit, his natural frame and temper, his lusts and corruptions, his natural sinful or spiritual weaknesses, that finding where his weakness lies, he may be careful to keep at a distance from all occasions of sin. Our Savior tells the disciples that they knew not what spirit they were of, which under a pretense of zeal betrayed them into ambition and desire of revenge. Had they known it, they would have washed over themselves. David tells us, Psalm 18.23, that he considered his ways and kept himself from his iniquity, which he was particularly prone to. There are advantages for temptations lying oftentimes in men's natural tempers and constitutions. Some are naturally gentle, facile, easy to be entreated, pliable, which, though it be the noblest temper of nature and the best and choicest ground, when well broken up and followed for grace to grow in, yet if not washed over, will be a means of innumerable surprises and entanglements and temptations. Others are earthy, froward, morose, so that envy, malice, selfishness, peevishness, harsh thoughts of others, repinings light the very door of their natures, and they can scarce step out, but they are in the snare of one or other of them. Others are passionate and the like. Now he that would watch that he enter not into temptation had need to be acquainted with his own natural temper, that he may watch over the treacheries that lie in it continually. Take heed lest you have a Jehu in you that shall make you drive furiously, or a Jonah in you that will make you ready to repine, or a David that will make you hasty in your determinations, as he was often in the warmth and goodness of his natural temper. He who watches not this thoroughly, who is not exactly skilled in the knowledge of himself, will never be disentangled from one temptation or another all his days. Again, as men have peculiar natural tempers, which, according as they are attended or managed, prove a great forms of sin, or advantage to the exercise of grace, so men may have particular lusts or corruptions, which either by their natural constitution or education and other prejudices have got deep rooting and strength in them. This also is to be found out by him who would not enter into temptation, unless he know it, unless his eyes be always on it, unless he observes its actings, motions, advantages that will continually be entangling and ensnaring of him. This, then, is our sixth direction in this kind. Labor to know thine own frame and temper, what spirit thou art of, what associates in thy heart Satan hath, where corruption is strong, where grace is weak, what stronghold lust hath in thy natural constitution and the like. How many have all their comforts blasted in peace disturbed by their natural passion and peevishness, how many are rendered useless in the world by their frowardness and discontent? How many are disquieted even by their own gentleness and facility? Be acquainted then with thine own heart, though it be deep, search it, though it be dark, inquire into it, though it give all its distempers other names and what are their due, believe it not. Were not men utter strangers to themselves? Did they not give flattering titles to their natural distempers? Did they not strive rather to justify, palliate, or excuse the evils of their hearts that are suited to their natural tempers and constitutions than to destroy them? and by these means keep themselves off from taking a clear and distinct view of them, it were impossible that they should all their days hang in the same briars without attempt for deliverance. Uselessness and scandal in professors or branches growing constantly on this root of unacquaintedness with their own frame and temper, and how few are there who will either study them themselves or bear with those who would acquaint them with them.
Number two, when thou knowest the state and condition of thy heart as to the particulars mentioned, watch against all such occasions and opportunities, employments, societies, retirements, businesses, as are apt to entangle thy natural temper or provoke thy corruption. It may be there are some ways, some societies, some businesses that you never in your life escape them, but suffer by them more or less through their suitableness to entice or provoke your corruption. It may be you are in a state and condition of life that were you day by day on the account of your ambition, passion, discontent, or the like. If you have any love to your soul, it is time for you to awake and deliver yourself as a bird from the evil snare. Peter will not come again to haste to the high priest's hall, nor would David walk again on the top of his house when he should have been on the high places of the field. But the particulars of this instance are so various and of such several natures in respect of several persons that it is impossible to enumerate them. Proverbs 4:14 4, and 15. Herein lies no small part of that wisdom which consists in our ordering our conversation aright. Seeing we have so little power over our hearts, when once they meet with suitable provocations, we are to keep them asunder, as a man would do fire in the combustible parts of the house wherein he dwells. Number 3. Be sure to lay in provision and store against the approaching of any temptation. This also belongs to our watchfulness over our hearts. You will say, What provision is intended, and where is it to be laid up? Our hearts, as our Savior speaks, are our treasury. There we lay up whatever we have, good or bad, and thence do we draw it for our use. Matthew 12.35 It is a heart, then, wherein provision is to be laid up against temptation. When an enemy draws nigh to a fort or a castle to besiege and take it, Oftentimes, if he find it well manned and furnished, with a provision for a siege, and so able to hold out, he withdraws and assaults it not. Is Satan, the prince of this world, come and find our hearts fortified against his batteries and provided to hold out, he not only departs, but as James says, he flees. He will flee from us. James 4, 7. For the provision to be laid up, it is that which is provided in the gospel for us. Gospel provisions will do this work. That is, keep the heart full of a sense of the love of God in Christ. This is the greatest preservative against the power of temptation in the world. Joseph had this, and therefore, on the first appearance of temptation, he cries out, How can I do this great evil and sin against God? And there is an end of the temptation as to him, it lays no hold on him, but departs. He was, he was furnished with such a ready sense of the love of God, his temptation could not stand before. Genesis 39.9 The love of Christ constraineth us, saith the apostle, to live to him. 2 Corinthians 5.14 And so consequently to withstand temptation. A man may, nay he ought to lay in provisions of the law also. Fear of death, hell, punishment, with the terror of the Lord in them. But these are far more easily conquered than the other. Nay, they will never stand alone against a vigorous assault. They are conquered and convince persons every day. Hearts stored with them will struggle for a while, but quickly give over. But store the heart with the sense of the love of God in Christ, with the eternal design of His grace, with the taste of the blood of Christ and His love in the shedding of it, get a relish of the privileges we have thereby, our adoption, justification, acceptation with God. Fill the heart with thoughts of the beauty of holiness, as it is designed by Christ for the end, issue, and effect of His death, and you will in an ordinary course of walking with God have great peace and security as to the disturbance of temptations. When men can live and plod on in their profession, and not be able to say when they had any living sense of the love of God or of the privileges which we have in the blood of Christ, I know not what they can have to keep them from falling into snares." The Apostle tells us that the peace of God, Philippians 4, 7, shall keep our hearts. 
The Greek word is a military word, a garrison, and it means shall keep as in a garrison. Now a garrison hath two things attending it. First, that it is exposed to the assaults of its enemies. Secondly, that safety lies in it from their attempts. It is so with our souls. They are exposed to temptations, assaulted continually. But if there be a garrison in them, or if they be kept as in a garrison, temptation shall not enter, and consequently we shall not enter into temptation. Now how is this done? saith he, the peace of God shall do it. What is this peace of God? A sense of his love and favor in Jesus Christ. Let this abide in you, and it shall garrison you against all assaults whatever. But besides, there is that in an especial manner, which is also in all the rest of the directions, namely that the thing itself lies in a direct opposition to all the ways and means that temptation can make use of to approach to our souls, contending to obtain and keep a sense of the love of God in Christ, in the nature of it, obviates all the workings and insinuations of temptation. Let this be a third direction, then, in our watching against temptation. Lay in store of gospel provisions that may make the soul a defense place against all the assaults of it. Number four, in the first approach of any temptation, as we are all tempted, these directions following are also suited to carry on the work of watching, which we are in the pursuit of. One, be always awake that thou mayest have an early discovery of your temptation, that you may know it so to be. Most men perceive not their enemy until they are wounded by him. Yea, others may sometimes see them deeply engaged, while themselves are utterly insensible. They sleep without any sense of danger until others come and awake them by telling them that their house is on fire. Temptation in a neuter sense is not easily discoverable, namely as it denotes such a way or thing or matter as is or may be made use of for the ends of temptation. Few take notice of it until it is too late, and they find themselves entangled if not wounded. Wash then to understand betimes the snares that are laid for you, to understand the advantages of your enemies and what they have against you, before they get strength and power, before they are incorporated with your lusts, and have distilled poison into your soul. Number two, consider the aim and tendency of the temptation, whatever it be, and of all that are concerned in it. Those who have an active concurrence into your temptation are Satan in your own lusts. For your own lust I have manifested elsewhere what it aims at in all its actings and enticings. It never rises up, but its intendment is the worst of evils. Every acting of it would be a formed enmity against God. Hence look upon it in his first attempts. What pretenses soever may be made as your mortal enemy. I hate it, saith the apostle, Romans 7.15, that is, the working of lust in me. I hate it. It is the greatest enemy I have. Oh, that it were killed and destroyed. Oh, that I were delivered out of the power of it. Know then that in the first attempt or assault in any temptation, the most cursed sworn enemy is at hand, is setting on you, and that for your utter ruin, so that it were the greatest madness in the world to throw yourself into his arms to be destroyed. But of this I have spoken in my discourse of mortification. Has Satan any more friendly aim and intention towards you, who is a share in every temptation? To beguile you as a serpent, to devour you as a lion, is a friendship that he owes you. I shall only add that the sin he tempts you to against the law, it is not the thing he aims at. His design lies against your interest in the gospel. He would make sin but a bridge to get over to a better ground, to assault you as to your interest in Christ. He who perhaps will say today, you may venture on sin because you have an interest in Christ, will tomorrow tell you to the purpose that you have none, because you have done so. Number three, meet your temptation in its entrance with thoughts of faith concerning Christ on the cross. This will make it sink before you. 
entertain no parley, no dispute with it, if you would not enter into it. Say, it is Christ that died, that died for such sins as these. This is called taking the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of Satan, Ephesians 6.16. Faith does it by laying hold on Christ crucified, his love therein, and what from thence he suffered for sin. Let your temptation be what it will, be it unto sin, to fear, or doubting for sin, or about your state and condition, it is not able to stand before faith lifting up the standard of the cross. We know what means the papists who have lost the power of faith used to keep up the form. They will sign themselves with the sign of the cross, or make aerial crosses, and by virtue of that work done, think to scare away the devil. To act faith on Christ crucified is really to sign ourselves as the sign of the cross, and thereby shall we overcome the wicked one. First Peter 5, 9, number 4. Suppose the soul has been surprised by temptation, and entangled at unaware, so that now it is too late to resist the first entrances of it. What shall such a soul do that it be not plunged into it, and carried away with the power of it? First... Do as Paul did, beseech God again and again that it may depart from you, Second Corinthians 12.8. And if you abide therein, you shall certainly either be speedily delivered out of it, or receive a sufficiency of grace not to be foiled utterly by it. Only as I said in part before, do not so much employ your thoughts about the things whereunto you are tempted, which oftentimes raises further entanglements, but set yourself against the temptation itself. Pray against the temptation that it may depart, and when that is taken away, the things themselves may become calmly considered. Secondly, fly to Christ in a peculiar manner, as he was tempted, and beg of him to give you succor in this needful time of trouble. Hebrews 4.16 The Apostle instructs us in this, in that he has been tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. This is the meaning of it. When you are tempted and ready to faint, when you want succor, you must have it or you die. Act faith peculiarly on Christ as he was tempted. That is, consider that he was tempted himself, that he suffered by this, that he conquered all temptations, and that not merely on his own account, seeing for our sakes he submitted to be tempted, but for us, he conquered in and by himself, but for us, and draw ye expect succor from him, Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. Lie down at his feet, make your complaint known to him, beg his assistance, and it will not be in vain. Thirdly, look to him who has promised deliverance. Consider that he is faithful and will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able. Consider that he has promised a comfortable issue of these trials and temptations. Call all the promises to mind of assistance and deliverance that he has made. Ponder them in your heart and rest upon it that God has innumerable ways that you know not of to give you a deliverance. As first, he can send in an affliction that shall mortify your heart to the matter of the temptation, whatever it be, that that which was before a sweet morsel under the tongue shall neither have taste or relish in it to you. Your desire to it shall be killed, as was the case with David. Or secondly, he can by some providence alter that whole state of things from whence your temptation does arise, so taking fuel from the fire, causing it to go out of itself as it was with the same David in the day of battle. Or thirdly, he can tread down Satan under your feet, that he shall not dare to suggest anything any more to your disadvantage. The God of peace shall do it, that you shall hear of him no more. Or fourthly, he can give you such supply of grace as that you may be freed, though not from the temptation itself, yet from the tendency and danger of it, as was the case with Paul. Or fifthly, he can give you such a comfortable persuasion of good success in the issue as that you shall have refreshment in your trials and be kept from the trouble of your temptation as was the case with the same Paul. Or sixthly, he can utterly remove it and make you a complete conqueror and innumerable other ways he has of keeping you from entering into temptation so as to be foiled by it. Fourthly, consider where the temptation 
in which you are surprised has made its entrance, and by what means and with all speed make up the breach. Stop that passage which the waters have made to enter in at. Deal with your soul like a wise physician. Inquire when, how, by what means you fell into this distemper. And if you find negligence, carelessness, lack of keeping watch over yourself to have lain at the bottom of it, fix your soul there. Be well that before the Lord make up that breach, and then proceed to the work that lies before you. Watching Against Temptation, Chapter 8 The directions insisted on in the former chapters are such as are partly given us in their several particulars up and down the scripture, partly arise from the nature of the thing itself. There is one general direction remains, which is comprehensive of all that went before, and also adds many more particulars to them. This contains an approved antidote against the poison of temptation, a remedy that Christ himself hath marked with a note of efficacy and success, that has given us Revelation 3.10 in the words of our Savior himself to the church of Philadelphia. Because, saith he, thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell in the earth. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. As he dealt with the church of Philadelphia, so he will deal with us. If we keep the word of his patience, he will keep us from the hour of temptation. This, then, be in a way of rolling the whole care of this weighty affair on him who is able to bear it. It requires our peculiar consideration. And therefore I shall show, number one, what it is to keep the word of Christ's patience, that we may know how to perform our duty, and number two, how this will be a means of our preservation, which will establish us in the faith of Christ's promise. Number one, the word of Christ is the word of the gospel, the word by him revealed from the bosom of the Father, the word of the word, the word spoken in time of the eternal word. So it is called the word of Christ, Colossians 3.16 or the Gospel of Christ, Romans 1.16, 1 Corinthians 9.12, and the Doctrine of Christ, Hebrews 6.1. Of Christ, that is, as its author, Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 and 2, and of him as the chief subject or matter of it, 2 Corinthians 1.20. Now this word is called the word of Christ's patience, or tolerance and forbearance, upon the account of that patience and long-suffering which, in the dispensation of it, the Lord Christ exercises towards the whole and to all persons in it, and that both actively and passively, in his bearing with men and enduring from them, he is patient toward his saints, he bears with them, suffers from them. He is patient to us, words, Second Peter 3, 9, that is, that believe. The gospel is a word of Christ's patience even to believers. A soul acquainted with the gospel knows that there is no property of Christ rendered more glorious therein than that of his patience that he should bear with so many unkindnesses, so many causeless breaches, so many neglects of his love, so many affronts done to his grace, so many violations of engagements as he does. It manifests his gospel to be not only the word of his grace, but also of his patience. He suffers also from them in all the reproaches they bring upon his name and ways, and he suffers in them, for in all their afflictions he is afflicted did towards his elect not yet effectually called revelation 320 he stands waiting at the door of their hearts and knocks for an entrance he deals with them by all means and yet stands and waits until his head is filled with the dew and his locks with the drops of the night canticles 52 as enduring the cold and inconveniences of the night that when his morning is come, he may have entrance.
Oftentimes for a long season he is by them scorned in his person, persecuted in his saints and ways, reviled in his word, whilst he stands at the door in the word of his patience with his heart full of love towards their poor rebellious souls. Also to the perishing world, Hence the time of his kingdom in this world is called the time of his patience, Revelations 1 9. He endures the vessels of wrath with much long suffering, Romans 9 22. Whilst the gospel is administered in the world, he is patient towards the men thereof until the saints in heaven and earth are astonished and cry out, How long? Psalm 13, 1 and 2, Revelation 6, 10, And themselves do mock at him as if he were an idol, Second Peter 3, 4. He endures from them bitter things in his name, ways, worship, saints, promises, threats, all his interest of honor and love, and yet passes by them, lets them alone, does them good. Nor will he cut this way of proceeding short until the gospel shall be preached no more. Patience must accompany the gospel. Now this is the word that is to be kept, that we may be kept from the hour of temptation. Number two. Three things are implied in the keeping of this word. First, knowledge. Second, valuation. Third, obedience. First, knowledge. He that will keep this word must know it, be acquainted with it, under a fourfold notion, as a word of grace and mercy to save him, as a word of holiness and purity to sanctify him, as a word of liberty and power to ennoble him and set him free, as a word of consolation to support him in every condition as a word of grace and mercy able to save us it is a power of god to salvation romans 1:16 the grace of god that bringeth salvation titus 2:11 the word of grace that is able to build us up and to give us an inheritance among all them that are sanctified acts 20:32 20, the word that is able to save our souls james 1:21 when the word of the gospel is known as a word of mercy, grace, and pardon, as a sole evidence for life, as a conveyance of an eternal inheritance, when the soul finds it such to itself, it will strive to keep it. Secondly, is a word of holiness and purity able to sanctify him? You are clean through the word I have spoken to you, saith our Savior, John 15:3. To that purpose is his prayer, chapter 17, verse 17. He that knows not the word of Christ's patience is a sanctifying, cleansing word, and the power of it upon his soul neither knows it nor keeps it. The empty profession of our days knows not one step towards this duty, and since it is that the most are so overborne under the power of temptations, men full of self and of the world, of fury, ambition, and almost all unclean lusts do yet talk of keeping the word of Christ. See 1 Peter 1, 2, 2 Timothy 2, 19. Thirdly, is a word of liberty and power to ennoble him and set him free, and this not only from the guilt of sin and from wrath, for that it does, as it is a word of grace and mercy, not only from the power of sin, for that it does, as it is a word of holiness, but also from all outward respects of men or the world that might entangle him or enslave him. It declares us to be Christ's free men and in bondage to none. John 8.32, 1 Corinthians 7.23 We are not by it freed from due subjection to superiors, nor from any duty, nor to any sin, 1 Peter 2.16, but in two respects it is a word of freedom, liberty, largeness of mind, power, and deliverance from bondage. In respect of conscience as to the worship of God, Galatians 5, 5, first, 
in respect of ignoble slavish respects to the men or things of the world in the course of our pilgrimage. Secondly, the gospel gives a free, large, and noble spirit in subjection to God and none else. There is administered in it a spirit not of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind, 2 Timothy 1, 7, a mind in nothing terrified, Philippians 1, 28, not swayed with any by respect, whatever. There is nothing more unworthy of the gospel than a mind in bondage to persons or things, prostituting itself to the lusts of men or affrightments of the world. And he that thus knows the word of Christ's patience, really and in power, is even thereby freed from innumerable, from unspeakable temptations. Fourthly, as a word of consolation to support him in every condition, and to be a full portion in the want of all. It is a word attended with joy unspeakable and full of glory. It gives supportment, relief, refreshment, satisfaction, peace, consolation, joy, boasting, glory, in every condition whatever. Thus to know the word of Christ's patience, thus to know the gospel is the first part, and it is a great part of this condition of our preservation from the hour and power of temptation. Number two, valuation of what is thus known belongs to the keeping of this word. It is to be kept as a treasure, Second Timothy 1.14, that excellent depositum, that is, the word of the gospel. Keep it, saith the apostle, by the Holy Ghost, and hold fast the faithful word, Titus 1.9. It is a good treasure, a faithful word. Hold it fast. It is a word that comprises the whole interest of Christ in the world. To value that as our chiefest treasure is to keep the word of Christ patience. They that will have a regard from Christ in the time of temptation are not to be regardless of his concernments. Obedience number three. Personal obedience and the universal observation of all the commands of Christ is the keeping of his word. John fourteen fifteen. Close adherence to Christ in holiness and universal obedience, then when the opposition that the gospel of Christ doth meet with in the world does render it signally the word of his patience, is the life and soul of the duty required. Now all these are to be so managed with that intention of mind and spirit, that care of heart and diligence of the whole person, as to make up a keeping of this word, which evidently includes all these considerations. We are arrived then to the sum of the safeguarding duty of this condition of freedom from the power of temptation. He that, having a due acquaintance with the gospel and its excellencies, as to him a word of mercy, holiness, liberty, and consolation, values it in all its concernments as his choicest and only treasure, makes it his business and the work of his life to give himself up unto it in universal obedience, then especially when opposition and apostasy put the patience of Christ to the utmost, he shall be preserved from the hour of temptation. This is that which is comprehensive of all that went before, and is exclusive of all other ways for the obtaining of the end proposed. Nor let any man think without this to be kept one hour from entering into temptation. Wherever he fails, there temptation enters. That this will be a sure preservative may appear from the ensuing considerations. 1. It has a promise of preservation, and this alone has so. It is solemnly promised in the place mentioned to the Church of Philadelphia on this account. When a great trial and temptation was to come on the world at the opening of the seventh seal, Revelation 7 3, a caution is given for the preservation of God's sealed ones which are described to be those who keep the word of Christ, for the promise is that it should be so. 
Now in every promise, there are three things to be considered. The faithfulness of the Father who gives it, the grace of the Son which is a matter of it, the power and efficacy of the Holy Ghost which puts the promise in execution, and all these are engaged for the preservation of such persons from the hour of temptation. The faithfulness of God accompanieth the promise. On this account is our deliverance laid, 1 Corinthians 10.13. Though we be tempted, yet we shall be kept from the hour of temptation. It shall not grow too strong for us. What comes on us we shall be able to bear, and what would be too hard for us we shall escape. But what security have we hereof? Even the faithfulness of God. God is faithful, who will not suffer you. And wherein is God's faithfulness seen and exercised? He is faithful that promised, Hebrews 10.23. His faithfulness consists in his discharge of his promises. He abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself, 2 Timothy 2.13. So that by being under the promise we have the faithfulness of God engaged for our preservation. Number two, there is in every promise of the covenant the grace of the Son, that is, the subject matter of all promises. I will keep thee. How? By my grace with thee. So that what assistance the grace of Christ can give a soul that has a right in this promise, in the hour of temptation it shall enjoy it. Paul's temptation grew very high. It was likely to have come to its prevalent hour. He besought the Lord, that is, the Lord Jesus Christ, for help, Second Corinthians 12.8, and received that answer from him, My grace is sufficient for thee. Verse 9, that it was the Lord Christ and his grace with whom he had peculiarly to do is evident from the close of that verse. I will glory in mine infirmity that the power of Christ may rest upon me, or the efficacy of the grace of Christ in my preservation be made evident. Number 3. The efficacy of the Spirit accompanies the promises. He is called the Holy Spirit of promise, not only because he is promised by Christ, but also because he effectually makes good the promise and gives it accomplishment in our souls. He also then is engaged to preserve the soul walking according to the rule laid down. Thus, where the promise is, there is all this assistance. The faithfulness of the Father, the grace of the Son, the power of the Spirit, all are engaged in our preservation. This constant universal keeping of Christ's word of patience will keep the heart and soul in such a frame as were in no prevalent temptation by virtue of any advantages whatever can seize upon it, so as totally to prevail against it. So David prays, Psalm twenty-five, twenty-one. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me. This integrity and uprightness is the Old Testament keeping the word of Christ, a universal close walking with God. Now how can they preserve a man? Why, by keeping his heart in such a frame, so defended on every side, that no evil can approach or take hold on him. Fail a man in his integrity, he hath an open place for temptation to enter. To keep the word of Christ is to do it universally, as has been showed. This exercises grace in all the faculties of the soul, encompasses it with the whole armor of God. The understanding is full of light, the affections of love and holiness. Let the wind blow from what quarter it will, the soul is fenced and fortified. Let, let the enemy assault, winner by what means he pleases. All things in the soul of such an one are upon the guard. How can I do this thing and sin against God is at hand? Especially on a twofold account does deliverance and security arise from this hand. Number one, by the mortification of the heart to the matter of temptations. The prevalency of any temptation arises from hence that the heart is ready to close with the matter of it. There are lusts within, suited to the proposals of the world or Satan without. Hence James resolves all temptations into our lusts.
chapter 114, because either they proceed from or are made effectual by them as has been declared. Why doth terror or threats turn us aside from a due constancy in the performance of our duty? Is it not because there is unmortified carnal fear abiding in us that tumultuates in such a season? Why is it that the allurements of the world and compliances with men entangle us? Is it not because our affections are entangled with the things and considerations proposed to us. Now keeping the word of Christ's patience in the manner declared keeps the heart mortified to these things, and so it is not easily entangled by them. Saith the Apostle Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. He that keeps close to Christ is crucified with him and is dead to all the desires of the flesh and the world is more fully chapter 614. Here the match is broken, and all love, entangling love, dissolved. The heart is crucified to the world and all things in it. Now the matter of all temptations almost is taken out of the world. The men of it, or the things of it, make them up. As to the things, saith the apostle, I am crucified to them, and it is so with every one that keeps the word of Christ. My heart is mortified to them. I have no desire after them, nor affection to them, nor delight in them, and they are crucified to me. The crowns, glories, thrones, pleasures, profits of the world, I see nothing desirable in them. The lusts, sensual pleasures, love, respects, honors of men, name and reputation among them, they are all as a thing of naught. I have no value nor estimation of them. This soul is safeguarded from assaults of manifold temptations. When Achan saw the goodly Babylonish garment in two hundred shekels of silver and a wedge of gold, first he coveted them, then he took them. Joshua 7.21 Temptation subtly spreads a Babylonish garment of favor, praise, peace, the silver of pleasure or profit, with the golden contentments of the flesh before the eyes of man. If now there be that in them alive, unmortified, that will presently fall a coveting, let what fear of punishment will ensue, the heart or hand will be put forth unto iniquity. Herein then lies the security of such a frame as that described. It is always accompanied with a mortified heart, crucified to the things that are the matter of our temptations, without which it is utterly impossible that we should be preserved one moment when any temptation doth befall us, if liking and love of the things proposed, insinuated, commended in the temptation, be living and active in us, we shall not be able to resist and stand. Number two. In this frame, the heart is filled with better things and their excellency so far as to be fortified against the matter of any temptation. See what resolution this puts Paul upon, Philippians 3.8. All is loss and dung to him. Who would go out of his way to have his arms full of loss and dung? And whence is it that he has this estimation of the most desirable things in the world? It is from that dear estimation he had of the excellency of Christ. So verse 10, when the soul is exercised to communion with Christ, and to walking with him, he drinks new wine and cannot desire the old things of the world, for he says, the new is better. He tastes every day how gracious the Lord is, and therefore longs not after the sweetness of forbidden things, which indeed have none. He that makes it his business to eat daily of the tree of life will have no appetite to other fruit, though the tree that bear them seem to stand in the midst of paradise. This espouse makes the means of her preservation, even the excellency which, by daily communion, she found in Christ and his grace is above all other desirable things. Let us all exercise itself to a communion with Christ in the good things of the gospel, pardon of sin, fruits of holiness, hope of glory, peace with God, 
joy in the Holy Ghost, dominion over sin, and he shall have a mighty preservative against all temptations. As a full soul loses the honeycomb, as a soul filled with carnal, earthly, sensual contentments finds no relish nor savor in the sweetest spiritual things, so he that is satisfied with the kindness of God, as with marrow and fatness, that is, every day entertained at the banquet of wine, wine upon the lees, and well refined, has a holy contempt of the baits and allurements that lie in prevailing temptations, and is safe. Number three, he that so keeps the word of Christ's patience is always furnished with preserving considerations and preserving principles, moral and real advantages of preservation. He is furnished with preserving considerations that powerfully influence his soul and is walking diligently with Christ. Besides the sense of duty which is always upon him, he considers first the concernment of Christ whom his soul loves in him and his careful walking. He considers that the presence of Christ is with him, his eye upon him that he ponders his heart and ways as one greatly concerned in his deportment of himself in a time of trial. So Christ manifests himself to do, Revelations 2, 19-23. He considers all, what is acceptable, what is to be rejected. He knows that Christ is concerned in his honor, that his name be not evil spoken of by reason of him that he is concerned in love to his soul, having that design upon him to present him holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, Colossians 1.22. And his spirit is grieved where he is interrupted in this work, concerned on the account of his gospel, the progress and acceptation of it in the world, its beauty would be slurred, its good things reviled, its progress stopped, if such an one be prevailed against, concerned in his love to others who are grievously scandalized, and perhaps ruined by the miscarriages of such. When Hymenaeus and Philetus fell, they overthrew the faith of some, and says such a soul then, who has exercised to keep the word of Christ patience, when intricate, perplexed, entangling temptations, public, private, personal, do arise, shall I now be careless, shall I be negligent, shall I comply with the world and the ways of it? Oh, what thoughts of heart hath he concerning me, whose eye is upon me? Shall I contemn his honor, despise his love, trample his gospel in the mire under the feet of men, turn aside others from his ways? Shall a man as I fly give over resistings? It cannot be. There is no man who keeps the word of the patience of Christ, but is full of the soul-pressing consideration. It dwells on his heart and spirit, and the love of Christ constrains him so to keep his heart and ways. Second Corinthians 5.14 Secondly, the great consideration of the temptations of Christ in his behalf, and the conquest he made in all assaults for his sake, and his God dwell also on his spirit. The prince of this world came upon him, everything in earth or hell that has either allurement or a frightening in it was proposed to him to divert him from the work of mediation, which for us he had undertaken. This whole life he calls the time of his temptations, but he resisted all, conquered all, and has become a captain of salvation to them that obey him. And says the soul, shall this temptation, these arguings, this plausible pretense, this sloth, this self-love, this sensuality, this beat of the world turn me aside, prevail over me, to desert him who went before me in the ways of all temptations, that his holy nature was obnoxious to for my good? Thirdly, Dismal thoughts of the loss of love, of the smiles of the countenance of Christ, do also frequently exercise such a soul. He knows what it is to enjoy the favor of Christ, to have a sense of his love, to be accepted in his approaches to him, to converse with him. And perhaps has been sometimes at some loss in this thing. And so knows also what it is to be in the dark distance from him. 
See the deportment of the spouse in such a case, Canticles 3-4. When she had once found him again, she holds him. She will not let him go. She will lose him no more. He that keeps the word of Christ's patience hath preserving principles whereby he has acted. Some of them may be mentioned. First, in all things he lives by faith and has acted by it in all his ways, Galatians 2.20. Now upon a twofold account has faith, when improved, the power of preservation from temptation annexed to it because it empties the soul of its own wisdom, understanding, and fullness, that it may act in the wisdom and fullness of Christ. The only advice for preservation in trials and temptation lies in that of the wise man, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. This is a work of faith. It is faith. It is to live by faith. The great cause of falling of men in trials is their leaning to or leaning upon their own understanding and counsel. What is the issue of it? Job 18.7 The steps of his strength shall be straightened, and his own counsel shall cast him down. First, he shall be entangled and then cast down, and all by his own counsel until he comes to be ashamed of it as Ephraim was, Hosea 10.6. Whenever in our trials we consult our own understandings, hearken to self-reasonings, though they seem to be good, intending to our preservation, yet the principle of living by faith is stifled, and we shall, in the issue, be cast down by our own counsels. Now nothing can empty the heart of the self-fullness but faith by living by it but not living to ourselves, but having Christ live in us, by our living by faith on Him. Secondly, faith making the soul poor, empty, helpless, destitute in itself, engages the heart, will, and power of Jesus Christ for assistance, of which I have spoken more at large elsewhere. Love to the saints with care that they suffer not upon our account, is a great preserving principle in the time of temptations and trials. How powerful this was in David, he declares in that earnest prayer. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. Psalm 69, 6. O let not me so miscarry that those for whom I would lay down my life should be put to shame, be evil spoken of, dishonored, reviled, contemned on my account for my failings. A selfish soul whose love is turned wholly inwards will never abide in a time of trial. Many other considerations and principles that those who keep the word of Christ's patience in the way and manner before described or attended with might be enumerated. But I shall content myself to appoint it at these mentioned. And will it now be easy to determine whence it is that so many in our days are prevailed on in the time of trial, that the hour of temptation comes upon them and bears them down more or less before it? Is it not because amongst the great multitude of professors that we have there are few that keep the word of the patience of Christ? If we willfully neglect or cast away our interest in the promise of preservation, is it any wonder if we be not preserved? There is an hour of temptation come upon the world to try them that dwell therein. It variously exerts its power and efficacy. There is not any way or thing wherein it may not be seen acting and putting forth itself in worldliness, in sensuality, in looseness of conversation, in neglect of spiritual duties, private, public, in foolish, loose, diabolical opinions, in haughtiness and ambition, in envy and wrath, in strife and debate, revenge and selfishness, in atheism and contempt of God does it appear. There are but branches of the same root, bitter streams of the same fountain, cherished by peace, prosperity, security, apostasies of professors, and the like. 
And alas, how many do daily fall under the power of this temptation in general. How few keep their garments girt about them and undefiled. And if any urging particular temptation befall any, what instances almost have we of any that escape? May we not describe our condition as the apostle, that of the Corinthians, in respect of an outward visitation? Some are sick, and some are weak, and many sleep. Some are wounded, some defiled, many utterly lost. What is the spring and fountain of this sad condition of things? Is it not as has been said? We do not keep the word of Christ's patience and universal close walking with him, and so lose the benefit of the promise given and an next thereunto. Should I go about to give instances of the thing? A professor's coming short of keeping the word of Christ, it would be a long work. These four heads would comprise the most of them first. Conformity to the world which Christ has redeemed us from, almost in all things with joy and delight and promiscuous compliances with the men of the world. Secondly, neglect of duties which Christ hath enjoyed, from close meditation to public order ordinances. Thirdly, strife, variance, and debate among ourselves, woeful judging and despising one another, upon account of things foreign to the bond of communion that is between the saints. Fourthly, self-fullness as to principles, and selfishness as to winds. Now where these things are, are not men carnal? Is the word of Christ's patience effectual in them? Shall they be preserved? They shall not. Would you, then, be preserved and kept from the hour of temptation? Would you watch against entering into it, as deductions from what has been delivered in this chapter? Take the ensuing cautions, one. Take heed of leaning on deceitful assistances, as on your own counsels, understandings, reasonings. Though you argue in them never so plausibly in your own defense, they will leave you, betray you. When the temptation comes to any height, they will all turn about and take part with your enemy, and plead as much for the matter of the temptation, whatever it be, as they pleaded against the end and issue of it before. The most vigorous actings, by prayer, fasting, and other such means, against that particular lust, corruption, temptation, wherewith you are exercised and have to do. This will not avail you if, in the meantime, there be neglects on other accounts. To hear a man wrestle, cry, contend, as to any particular of temptation, and immediately fall into worldly ways, worldly compliances, looseness and negligence, and other things, it is righteous with Jesus Christ to leave such an one to the hour of temptation. The general security of saints' perseverance and preservation from total apostasy, number three. Every security that God gives us is good in its kind and for the purpose for which it is given us. But when it is given for one end to use it for another, that is not good or profitable. To make use of the general assurance of preservation from total apostasy to support the spirit in respect of a particular temptation will not in the issue advantage the soul, because notwithstanding that, this or that temptation may prevail. Many relieve themselves with this until they find themselves in the depth of perplexities. Number two, apply yourselves to this great preservation of faithful keeping the word of Christ's patience in the midst of all trials and temptations. In particular, wisely consider wherein the word of Christ's patience is most likely to suffer in the days wherein we live and the seasons that pass over us, and so vigorously set yourselves to keep it in that particular peculiarly. You will say, how shall we know where in the word of Christ patience in any season is like to suffer? I answer, consider what works he peculiarly performs in any season, and neglect of his word in reference to them is that wherein his word is like to suffer. The works of Christ wherein he hath been peculiarly engaged in our days and seasons seems to be this, one, 
the pouring of contempt upon the great men and great things of the world with all the enjoyments of it. He has discovered the nakedness of all earthly things and overturning, overturning, overturning both men and things to make way for the things that cannot be shaken. Two, the owning of the lot of his own inheritance in a distinguishing manner, putting a difference between the precious and the vile, and causing his people to dwell alone, is not reckoned with the nations. 3. In being near to faith and prayer, honoring them above all the strength and counsels of the sons of men. 4. In recovering his ordinances and institutions from the carnal administrations that they were in bondage under by the lusts of men, bringing them forth in the beauty and power of the Spirit. Wherein then, in such a season, must lie the peculiar neglect of the word of Christ's patience? Is it not in setting a value on the world and the things of it, which he has stained and trampled underfoot? Is it not in the slighting of his peculiar lot, his people, and casting them into the same considerations with the men of the world? Is it not in leaning to our own counsels and understandings? Is it not in the defilement of his ordinances by giving the outward court of the temple to be trod upon by unsanctified persons? Let us, then, be watchful. And in these things, keep the word of the patience of Christ if we love our own preservation. 2. In this frame, merge the Lord Jesus Christ with his blessed promises, with all the considerations that may be apt to take and hold the king in his galleries, that they may work on the heart of our blessed and merciful high priest, to give suitable succor at time of need. Of Temptation, Chapter 9 General Exhortation to the Duty Prescribed Having thus passed through the considerations of the duty of watching that we enter not into temptation, I suppose I need not add motives to the observance of it. Those who are not moved by their own sad experiences, nor the importance of the duty is laid down in the entrance of this discourse, must be left by me to the further patience of God. I shall only shut up the whole with a general exhortation to them who are in any measure prepared for it by the consideration of what has been spoken. Should you go into an hospital and see many persons lying sick and weak, sore and wounded, with many filthy diseases and distempers, and should inquire of them how they fell into this condition, and they shall all agree to tell you such or such a thing was the occasion of it, by that I got my wound, says one, and my disease, says another, would it not make you a little careful how or what you had to do with that thing or place? Surely it would. Should you go to a dungeon and see many miserable creatures bound in chains for an approaching day of execution, and inquire the way and means whereby they were brought into that condition, and they should all fix on one and the same thing, would you not take care to avoid it? The case is so with entering into temptation. Ah, oh, how many poor, miserable, spiritually wounded souls have we everywhere. One wounded by one sin, another by another sin. One falling into filthiness by the flesh, another of the spirit. Ask them now how they came into this estate and condition, they must all answer. Alas, we entered into temptation, we fell into curses, snares, and entanglements, and that has brought us into the woeful condition you see. Nay, if a man could look into the dungeons of hell, and see the poor damned souls that lie bound in chains of darkness, and hear their cries, what would he be taught? What did they say? Are they not cursing their tempters and the temptations they entered in? And shall we be negligent in this thing? Solomon tells us that the simple one that follows a strange woman knows not that the debtor there, that her house inclineth to death and her paths to the dead, which you repeat three times, and that is the reason that he ventures on her snares. If he knew what has been done by entering into temptation, perhaps, 
perhaps you would be more watchful and careful. Men may think that they shall do well enough notwithstanding, but can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burnt? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burnt? Proverbs 6, 27 and 28. No such thing. Men come not out of their temptation without wounds, burning, and scars. I know not any place in the world where there is more need of pressing this exhortation than in this place. Go to our several colleges, inquire for such and such young men. What is the answer in respect of many? Ah, such an one was very hopeful for a season, but he fell into ill company, and he is quite lost. Such an one had some good beginning of religion. We were in great expectation of him, but he has fallen into temptation, and so in other places. Such an one was useful and humble, adorned the gospel, but now he is so woefully entangled with the world that he has grown all self hath no sap nor savor. Such an one was humble and zealous, but he is advanced and has lost his first love and ways. Oh, how full is the world! How full is this place of these woeful examples, to say nothing of those innumerable poor creatures who are fallen into temptations by delusions and religion. And is it not time for us to awake before it be too late to watch against the first rising of sin, the first attempts of Satan, and all ways whereby he has made his approaches to us, be they never so harmless in themselves? Have, have we not experience of our weakness? our folly, the invincible power of temptation when once it is gotten within us. As for this duty that I have insisted on, take these considerations, number one. If you neglect it, it being the only means prescribed by your Savior, you will certainly enter into temptation and is certainly fall into sin. Flatter not yourselves." Some of you are old disciples, have a great abhorrency of sin. You think it is impossible you should ever be seduced so and so. But let him, whoever he be, that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. It is not any grace received, it is not any experience obtained, it is not any resolution improved that will preserve you from any evil, unless you stand upon your watch. What I say unto you, says Christ, I say unto all, Watch. Perhaps you may have had some good success for a time in your careless frame, but awake, admire God's tenderness and patience, or evil lies at the door. If you will not perform this duty, whoever you are, one way or other, in one thing or other, spiritual or carnal wickedness, you will be tempted, you will be defiled, and what will be the end thereof? Remember Peter. Number two. Consider that you are always under the eye of Christ, a great captain of our salvation, who hath enjoined us to watch thus, and pray that we enter not into temptation. What well, think you are the thoughts, and what the heart of Christ, when he sees a temptation hastening towards us, a storm rising about us, and we are fast asleep? Doth it not grieve him to see us expose ourselves so to danger, after he has given us warning upon warning? While he was in the days of his flesh, he considered his temptation, whilst it was yet coming, and armed himself against it. The prince of this world cometh, saith he, but has no part in me. And shall we be negligent under his eye? Do but think that thou seest him come unto thee as he did to Peter, when he was asleep in the garden with the same reproof. What? Canst thou not watch one hour? Would it not be a grief to you to be so reproved, or to hear him thundering against your neglect from heaven and against the church of Sardis? Revelation 3.2 Number three, consider that if thou neglect this duty and so fall into temptation, which assuredly you will do, that when you are entangled, God may with bring some heavy affliction or judgment upon thee, which by reason of your entanglement you shall not be able to look on any otherwise than as an evidence of his anger and hatred. And then what will you do when your temptation and affliction come together? 
all thy bones will be broken and your peace and strength will be gone in a moment. This may seem but as a noise of words for the present, but if ever it be your condition, you will find it to be full of woe and bitterness. Oh, then, let us strive to keep our spirits unentangled, avoiding all appearance of evil, and always leading thereunto, especially always businesses, societies, and employments that we have already found disadvantageous to us.